I know that a couple of people are going to be joining late. So good evening. It is 6.02 p.m. My name is John Mursky, and as chair of the Ann Arbor Energy Commission, I'm calling this meeting to order. I am participating from my home in Ann Arbor. Welcome to the February 14th, 2023 electronic meeting of the Energy Commission. This virtual meeting is to affect social distancing and to mitigate the spread of the COVID-19 virus. We will conduct this meeting like uh, an in-person meeting. Commissioners, during roll call, please indicate your location. Also during the meeting, please remain on camera just as you would be visible during an in-person meeting. Finally, mute your mi microphone when not speaking. Public comment will be via telephone only. To speak during any of the public comment opportunities at the beginning and at the end of the meeting, please call one of the following two toll numbers, toll free numbers, 877-853-5247 or 888-788-0099 and enter the meeting ID number five, excuse me, nine, five, six, eight, seven, one, eight, seven, eight, seven, six on your phone. This information is all avail also available on the published agenda and in the meeting public notices of the city's website, as well as on the broadcast of this meeting on CTN channel 16, AT&T channel 99, and online at www.a2gov.org backslash watch CTN. Joe, would you please read the land acknowledgement? Yep, can do. Give me a second. A uh, couple people are in the uh, attendees list. Let me add them first. Um, yes, uh, I acknowledge that the land the city of Ann Arbor occupies is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe and Wyandotte peoples. I further acknowledge that our city stands, like almost all property in the United States, on lands obtained generally in unconsciousable ways from indigenous peoples. The taking of this land was formalized by the Treaty of Detroit in 1807. Knowing where we live, work, study, and recreate does not change the past, but a thorough understanding of the ongoing consequences of this past can empower us in our work to create a future that supports human flourishing and justice for all individuals. Thank you very much. And if you now uh, take the roll call. Yep. Um, Commissioner Maycomer. Uh, present from my home in Ann Arbor. Commissioner Levin. Here from my home in Ann Arbor. Uh, Chair Mursky. Here calling in from my home in Ann Arbor. Uh, Vice Chair Colvin Garcia. You're still on mute there. Here uh, from my home in Ann Arbor. Uh, Council Member Briggs is not here yet. Council Member Briggs will be 10 minutes late. She texted me just a little while ago. Okay. Um, Council Member Radina will not be able to join tonight. Correct. Um, Commissioner McCoy, let's see. She just texted me. She's also not going to be able to join. She did send me some input that I hope to remember to uh, provide to the rest of the commission on some of the agenda items. And I also forwarded that to Commissioner Calvin Garcia. So be, hopefully between the two of us, we uh, share that with you. Great, thank you. Um, Commissioner Kerber. Here from Ann Arbor. Commissioner Overpeck. Here from Ann Arbor. Commissioner Smith. Here from my home in Ar Ann Arbor. Um, Commissioner Conan, let me know they will not be able to make it today. Um, Commissioner Zittleman. Here in Ann Arbor. Commissioner Harp. Here joining from Ann Arbor. And Commissioner Berkowitz. Here, my home in Ann Arbor. All right, Chair, you have a quorum. 
Great, thank you very much. So, um, I'd appreciate it if we could, yeah, um, Commissioner McKenna. Do you have a question or? Hi, no, I didn't get to say that I was present, but I am present. Ah. Oh, okay. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, um, we have a pretty busy agenda tonight. Hopefully you all had a chance to look at it as well as the materials we're gonna be covering. And I would uh, like to entertain now a motion to approve the agenda in a second. Motion from Commissioner Colin Garcia, second. From Commissioner McCumber, uh, any discussion? Just one point from my perspective. Um, the last agenda point was a last minute ad. So if we are running really late, then I'll drop, we'll drop that and consider that at the next meeting. Um, so everybody in favor of the agenda is published. Please raise your hand and say aye. 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 That's unanimous. So that passes. Thank you very much. Um, approval of the minutes. Uh, the minutes are also posted, pretty straightforward, uh, and I have a motion to approve the minutes and a second. So a motion from Commissioner Zillman and a second from Commissioner McCumber. Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Any one uh, have any objection to the minutes? Seeing none, uh, the minutes pass. Thanks very much. So uh, public input, this is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes. As I mentioned earlier, if you're watching on CTN, please call 888-788-0098. Or 877-853-5247 and enter meeting ID 956-8718-7876. This information is also displayed on the meeting agenda and video feed. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand by one by one using the last three digits of your phone number to electronically raise your hand <clears throat> to indicate your desire to speak, please press star nine on your phone. You will hear an automated message announcement that the host is allowing you to speak. And when speaking, please move to a quiet place and mute any background noise so that we may hear you clearly. And then finally, please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. All right. Um, caller ending in two, four, five. Hello, you can hear me? Yep. Yes. Uh, good evening, Energy Commissioners. I'm Kathleen Murphy. I live at 315 Linda Vista Street in Ward 5. I have comments on several parts of your agenda tonight. One. OSI's draft climate millage budget includes $700,000 next year and $690,000 the following year for, quote, landfill, solar, or community-wide renewable energy program slash buy. This part buy refers, I believe, to these PPAs or virtual public power agreements. These are energy future swaps on renewable energy generated in another remote era, area. While VPAs may allow for the construction of new wind or solar, they will not reduce carbon emissions unless they replace fossil fuel generations. By comparison, renewable energy generation built locally could be directed use, directly used to reduce our demand for fossil fuel power. Two, City Council's outreach resolution includes a part that says DTE should meet with the Energy Commission on a regular basis. I think this gives DTE an outside voice at the Energy Commission meetings. The Energy Commission can, however, invite DTE to its meetings at any time. DTE should not be 
at Energy Commission meetings on a regular basis. Three, I support the resolution calling for city climate action performance transparency measures. Transparency is particularly necessary during this time of rapid changes. Four, I strongly support the gas ban ordinance. The city, city's A20 climate action plan calls for all new buildings to be all electric and net zero energy starting in 2022. The city has approved seven all electric development projects since 2020, demonstrating the feasibility of all electric new construction. Mainly, the gas ban seems like the surest way to ensure reaching net zero by 2030 and maintaining that thereafter. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Um, caller ending in 228. Hello, my name is Greg Woodring. I live at 1012 West Cross, and I am also the president of Ann Arbor for Public Power. Uh, I'm calling in to speak on several uh, items within the agenda. You all have a pretty packed agenda today full of some really fantastic stuff. Um, I share the previous speaker's concerns around virtual power purchase agreements. While that is a backup for if the landfill solar deal does not go through, uh, from what we've heard, the landfill solar deal does seem to be delayed, uh, likely indefinitely. Um, in that case, the uh, bu um, budget item would mean that we would be investing about 10% of the millage funds into virtual power purchase agreements. Uh, virtual power purchase agreements are a very complex and risky investment for the city to be undertaking. Well, it certainly could accelerate the construction of renewable energy generation elsewhere. Uh, as a result, we're not really going to be entirely sure, at least as far as I'm aware, that that generation is going to be replacing fossil fuel generation. If it's simply uh, servicing, increasing uh, or expanding demand, well, it would be better than it, that demand being serviced by fossil fuel generation. It doesn't actually do anything to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Uh, Furthermore, that money could be going towards uh, pursuing a project like city-owned landfill solar, uh, which is a proposal that an arm for public power has proposed to uh, OSI and uh, sent a draft uh, proposal around to various members on the Energy Commission. Um, if we, if you would all like to speak more of that about that, an arm for public power would be happy to uh, discuss our proposal with you for pursuing a city-owned landfill solar installation. Additionally, uh, I would like to point out that the, the, while the resolution on the DTE outage contains many great points, it would be great. It, uh, it does seem as if the DTE speaking spot on the uh, EC agenda would be a little out of place. It would, uh, from our reading, give a outsized voice on Energy Commission to DTE and provide a platform for them to spread uh, likely propaganda. Uh, you know, just recently, we had this massive 30 outage. seconds. Oh, thank you. The day after DTE bragged their shareholders that they had been different. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Caller ending in 998. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I'm calling from an area without the best connection, so please stop me if you don't understand what I'm saying. Um, my name is Zachariah Farum, and I live at 2222 Fuller Court. I'm also a member of the Renters Commission. Um, and I, I'm calling in to share some of the concerns that we have just been mentioned by some other residents, um, including my concerns about BPPAs. Um, I am very concerned that this is going to be pushing off uh, the climate problem onto another community uh, rather than really de developing here in Ann Arbor the, the means to become a sustainable model city, which was my understanding of what the 820 plan is trying to achieve. I don't think that BPPAs do that. Um, I'm also calling in to support 
um, the, the gas ban ordinance. Um, I, I think that this is a very good idea. I think it's overdue. And uh, I'd like to point out that the 820 plan operates on the assumption that buildings uh, that are being built right now are not being built with natural gas. It's already operating on the assumption that we've passed this thing. So I think that we just need to get this thing passed. I, I fully support it. And I'm um, introducing a, a version of this resolution to the Renters Commission. I'd like to give a shout out to um, the OSI staff who uh, made a released a draft letter, which is very well written and had a lot of good, uh, great sources about why this, uh, about the dangers of na natural gas appliances. Um, and uh, and I, I, I know that there's some uh, talk about renegotiating the franchise agreement for gas, but I don't see how that would interfere. So I think that the city should go full steam ahead on both on both uh, from both angles, I guess. Um, and I'm also calling it to support the the resolution um, demanding accountability for DTE. Um, I like it was pre previously stated by other speakers. It has some great points. And I'm glad that the city is recognizing and agreeing with the frustrations of um, of, of the residents of our city and beyond. Um, I, I do share the concern that, um, if I understand it correctly, that if there is going to be a slot at every energy commission meeting for a DTE rep to talk, I am very concerned about the um, how they will use that platform. I've seen how they've used other government platforms. Uh, they had a, a table, uh, I think the last spring green fair, and it, 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 they were trying to sell something called renewable natural gas subscriptions. So the idea is you could offset your fossil fuel impact by buying more fossil fuels, but of a different kind of quote, renewable natural gas. I just think that's complete nonsense. And this is how they're gonna use the platform if we give it to them. So I'm very- 30 seconds. About that. Um, and I also would finally like to say that I, I fully support this resolution on transparency. I think that if the H zero plan is gonna be a living document, a living plan for our city, uh, we have to have transparency. So I, I think it's beautifully written. Um, I'm very excited to see how this meeting goes, and I'm very grateful for all the work that's been that's gone into these resolutions. Thank you. Thanks Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, caller ending in zero one zero. Caller ending in zero one zero. If you're talking, you're still on mute. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is Wayne Appleyard. I'm a former energy commission and I uh, live in Grass Lake uh, and I'm an architect. Uh, I've been a green architect for over 40 years. I have two comments this evening. First and, and most important, we do have a climate emergency and we have to act quickly. Um, we have to stop new natural gas installations as soon as possible. Ken Garber's report clearly shows us that to continue is not acceptable. Every new installation commits uh, to an increase in Ann Arbor's greenhouse gas emissions for 20 or 30 years. There needs to be an immediate moratorium on installations and an ordinance permanently banning them um, as enacted as soon as possible. In my opinion, all who have the ability to stop these emissions and don't should be held directly complicit for the emission of the additional greenhouse gases from this day forward. It should become considered part of their personal carbon footprint. Secondly, after viewing the proposed usage of the millage that funds that's gonna be shown tonight, I find it ultimately uh, lacking in enumeration as to how many tons of greenhouse gas emissions will be eliminated by these actions. I went back to the A20.4.0 uh, plan and still couldn't find much in the way of uh, amounts of greenhouse gas emissions that were gonna be reduced for many of the items that are listed tonight. Um, this list is different than the one that was on the website uh, before the millage was passed, but that's okay. Millage funds should be spent wisely and to directly reduce greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible. The citizens passed this millage to address climate change and are relying on council and staff to determine how best to spend these millage funds, but it needs to be openly quantified. This is labeled a draft and I certainly hope that it will be reevaluated for greenhouse gas emissions and altered if necessary to, to achieve the greatest reductions. 
I also hope that the city will move forward and up now take to institute the sustainable energy utility because I think that's the best uh, way to greenhouse gas emission reductions uh, in the short and the long term. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, caller ending in three, four, zero. Good evening. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Lauren Sargent, 36 year resident of Ann Arbor, 2815 Ember Way, co founder of Washington 350, and one very unhappy, air quote, customer of DPE. I'm calling tonight uh, to support all three resolutions before you, but I want to highlight number two transparency of climate, energy, and A20 performance. We are on the precipice of a climate disaster, and as we heard at the UM Wege lecture last night, we have seven years, maybe, to begin to mitigate the worst of what is coming. To do this, we must ensure that the community is fully informed and engaged, and we need to be able to track progress toward our A20 goal, figures that are clear, specific, measurable, and achievable. Resolution number three, accelerated action to ban gas connections in new construction and major renovation and incentivizing all electric construction. This is an action that we can take that is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and urgent. When we are in a hole, as we most certainly are, step one is to stop digging, literally. No new infrastructure for fossil fuel. Communities across the country have already taken this step. No new infrastructure for fossil fuel. Zero, as in A2, zero. Let's do this now. The hour is late. We must act with the urgency and resolve that this crisis demands. And VPPAs are not such an action. That doesn't give us one kilowatt hour of savings on our local energy burden. It doesn't save anybody on their energy bill. It's a complicated and difficult to track or measure method, and we can do much better. Resolution number one, we must hold DTE accountable for their gross failure during our recent ice storm. They tell us that they're doing a crackerjack job of hardening their infrastructure while simultaneously boasting to shareholders of $97 million in deferred maintenance, $1.1 billion to Wall Street in 2022 in profit, and yet another rate increase to MPSC. And no, that is not in response to our recent ice storms because they filed that on February 10th. I hope that there will be a friendly amendment so that DTE can be summoned to speak before energy at any time, but they do not need a de facto seat at the table giving them a podium to greenwash. I urge you to take action on all three and to consider eliminating the seat at the table podium for marketing from DTE. We know that they do not tell the truth. We must hold them accountable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have one more caller with a raised hand. I see a couple others in there or in the in the queue with no raised hand. So if you're wanting to speak, please make sure to raise your hand. Um, caller ending in 194. Hi, commissioners. This is Rita Mitchell calling from 621 Fifth Street. I am an environmental commissioner, but I'm speaking for myself tonight. And I agree with the statements that you've heard. Um, I also want to call out one thing that's slightly different from what you've heard tonight. And that is when I dialed into this meeting, I saw a brief ad for DTE on CTN. Um, 15 seconds, maybe 10. It just was really um, odd to see that and uncomfortable for me. Um, I specifically support the transparency resolution that you'll be um, discussing tonight, in particular because I really believe that we need those clear-cut goals and we need to assess them in an ongoing way so that we really know the, the direction that we're going. We, need, we do know the goal. We know that we want renewable energy and clean air, water, land, et cetera, Without measuring, measuring along the way, it's almost as if we turn on a map quest and then take one look at it and put a phone away and then try to walk towards some place that we've never been before. We really need to use the measurements that are available to us and constantly assess the way we're going. Use them as real metrics. 
and it'll help guide us quicker. I also support the natural gas gas scan, <laughs> yes, then. and um, a big concern about that, as a, that I know you know, is that we have the opportunity to stop this right now. And if we continue to place natural gas lines in new buildings, we'll be using those buildings for perhaps another 100 years, who knows? But why would we do that when we know it's not a good idea now, when we know that we'll have to retrofit them in the future, when we know it's extremely expensive to retrofit buildings? This is the time to do it right the first time. And I'll just say lastly um, that having DTE at the table on a routine basis is not a good idea. You've heard it. I agree with this policy spoken before me. So thank you. And I appreciate all the work you're doing tonight. And you know, you've got a big agenda. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more at the moment. Um, caller ending in five three four. Good evening. This is Tom Stalberg calling from the north side of town, lower town. I'll be brief because a lot of what I would say has already been said by the previous caller and other callers as well. I will focus on one element then. If you watched, if any of you watched, and I know some of you spoke actually at the last city council meeting, there's a development that I've been following since its pre PUD presentation up on North Maple. And I really want to applaud that and ask those of you who haven't been following it to take a look at that, what that is. Uh, a developer looked at what the city's goals were and said, how do I design a project to meet the city's goals, including affordability and sustainability? And I want to applaud that developer because they came forward with a project that meets those goals. We can do this. For every development that says we're not gonna, or we can't, or for everybody who says we have too many competing interests, I want to point out the examples of those that believe in it, and practice it and start from scratch on a project to design it to work. It can be done. I think every new development that comes in, along with a lot of other things, should have essentially an environmental impact measurement. There's some things we might have to approve. We don't have the ability to turn them down. But as part of that decision at the council table, at the planning commission table, should be measurements. Every home that's built that isn't electrified. What is the carbon deficit that that puts us into that we need to make up for if we're going to meet our A20 goals? Every decision we need, every, every decision we make, if we're going to hit a number by 2030 and that number being zero, we need to know what all the negatives are that we need to overcome. And we need to know the measurements, the numbers on every single project that comes before our city for approval. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, caller ending in two zero zero. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, my name is Kim Tyking uh, at twenty seven oh one International Drive. Um, I'm a resident of this area and. I strongly support what other callers have said, um, and I really appreciate their input. Um, I am calling specifically in support of the gas ban ordinance. Um, I feel like it's very necessary to help us create a sustainable future going forward, um, and like crucial in helping, like from further contributing to the climate crisis. Like I have seen a lot of damage, and I continue to see like corporations be in control of like the steps that we're taking. So I'm also, I also support um, the other resolutions involving DTE um, being held accountable and the transparency and seeing like what steps are being taken because I don't want to like, I don't want to sit around and have knowing that DTE is having more of a say in the future when I know they can't be trusted. Um, which is why I'm calling in today to share my voice on the matter as well. 
Um, so I also very much appreciate what you guys are doing tonight. Um, and I hope to see this meeting go well. And I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, caller ending in four, six, four. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thanks. Um, my name is Linda Barauer. I live at 421 Third Street. Wow, I didn't expect all these speakers, but I pretty much agree with everything everybody said. I want to thank you so much for putting forth this, I don't know who wrote it, but the transparency and accountability resolution is wonderful. I hope everybody will support it. Um, we really need metrics for the performance of the A2Z plan, a to zero plan, and also for um, how the climate millage funds are being expended. I, from the very beginning, I supported the A20 plan, but honestly, from the beginning, I was a little bit concerned about specific goals and metrics. It seemed kind of vague, and I know that it can be strengthened. And I think if you recommend this to council, uh, this transparency and accountability recommendations, um, we can get some improvement. So thank you for that. I'm concerned that some of the budget items are a little bit vague, and I agree with the speakers who voice concern. It's something called virtual. I'm sorry, I don't remember what it's called exactly, but it sounds like carbon offsets on the marketplace. And I know that's very complex, and I really think we should be using the limited millage funds for um, more direct action in terms of really cutting emissions here where we live. Um, so that's one thing. I totally support the gas ban. I spoke uh, in support of it at the planning commission meeting. Um, whereas, you know, it was tabled. I think, I think council is concerned um, about the legal issues, and I think that they have legal staff looking into that. Um, I believe that I believe that the planning commission staff have some ideas. Of, you know, it, we can't do it via the building code until hopefully our new democratic legislature changes the building code and allows it that way. But they're looking into doing it via zoning. And I urge you to make this recommendation because I think hearing it from the Energy Commission will make a big difference to council. I think they just need a little bit of encouragement. You know, I think maybe they want to do it, but they're afraid. And the other thing, this is very important. The argument I hear at many, many public meetings, people are saying, well, if we make it too hard for builders, they won't build. And we want density because density will cut emissions because it will roof reduce commuter traffic into the city because more people will live here. But I have read analyses. I, am, I think Ken Garber did one um, in terms of the cost benefit between cutting emissions by reduced commuter traffic versus not having emissions 30 from, new gas hookups, from new gas hookups. And it's very clear. I'm not a mathematician, but I believe the work of whoever did this analysis that that's true. And I there's this mantra <laughs> in the public that you know reducing increasing density to reduce commuter emissions is the only solution and it's obviously not please pass the ban on gas hookups for new construction thank you so much for all your work thank you uh no more hands thank you very much it's gratifying to have all the public engagement i have to say and we're going to hear soon about uh, engagement, and hopefully it will be even better and more equitable going forward. <laughs> um, any, uh, so that that's it, right? You said, Joe, no, nobody else in the meantime. Yep. Okay, no more right. hands. Okay, so um, we are now into the meat of our agenda. The first is um, a, a presentation, or maybe more a discussion um, about the climate action millage and proposed spending. And we have uh, Missy Stoltz joining us. And so, Missy, I'll turn it over to you and you can talk about how you'd like to structure the discussion. Sure, thanks, Chair Mursky. So I just wanna start by thanking you for having me back. Uh, the slides are identical to what you saw before. And there's a reason for that, that things haven't shifted because we've kept pretty high fidelity to what we told the voters before. But I also understand you have some questions. And so instead of walking through slides that you've already seen, I would love to take your questions and answer those most directly. And I do um, actually want to take a moment and start with what we heard a lot of public comments on. I was a little bit surprised to see the VPPA pop as a topic of discussion for folks. I would just remind everyone uh, that listened and that called in and for this body and city council, 
that you actually adopted energy criteria and principles, and council uses those too, which actually guide our energy decision making. And some of those core criteria are location, meaning we were never looking at locations outside of Michigan and DT service territory, and they were additionality. And so everything that we bring forward in terms of energy choices has to go through those criteria and principles. So I, I recognize that it can feel like a big, scary uh, term or concept in the field is very, very complex. But I just want to assure folks that this body, as well as city council, give us very clear direction on what we're supposed to evaluate with our energy choices. And there's so many moving parts. I just wanted to bring that back up for folks to kind of hold in their mind. So Chair Mursky, I'll turn it over to you if you want to facilitate questions or if you want to start with them. Uh, no, I, I'd like to take them um, from uh, the group. Uh, I mean, I have a few, as I mentioned, together with Carlene, um, and actually I'll recognize Carlene to uh, maybe pose her own or those that were submitted by commissioners that couldn't make it tonight. So, and by the way, thank you for those clarifying remarks. Um, we've talked about some of that here in the past, but uh, obviously it bears uh, repeating. So thanks very much. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Calvin Garcia. Thanks so much, John. Um, Missy, great to see you. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for like like starting right away with clarifying the the, the your core criteria that was that were originally you know part of part of the, the the climate action plan, and can you just elaborate a little bit further on how that connects with uh, you know the virtual power plant agreements? Like, does that connect at all, or like how does that connect? Because you mentioned both in this in your in the same statements that you just were making. Can you please connect them for? For me, yeah, yeah. So we have, there's many ways to sort of take this. So I'm going to start a little deep. And if you want to go deeper, you let me know and we'll, we'll go down. We'll go as deep as you guys want to go on this one. What I would say is we put money in the budget to either move the landfill solar project forward or, um, and let me say, and because we have money for on site renewables in the community too. Like there are line items to deploy more solar at city facilities. There's money for rebates. Um, actually, the two largest chunk of uh, chunks of dollars that we have are for direct rebates to residents and businesses to make improvements in alignment with 820. It's actually the largest uh, source of funding that we have at almost $2 million, just shy in year one and then almost at it in year two. <clears throat> so the most majority of the money is gonna actually go right back out the door. Um, and there are procedural things I wanna flag we're working on an assessment that everyone has to get for free. Uh, so we have a staff person we're looking to hire you know what, I need to start with a qualifier. This is a proposed budget. It has not been adopted. So everything I'm saying is only proposed, right? So please bear that in mind. City Council adopts the budget. So I'm telling you what OSI has put forward. Okay. Just, I don't want you to go and be like, guess what? We have okay. this thing. We don't yet. <laughs> Council's going to do their job on it. Uh, so what we proposed is creating this A20 assessment, which we already use in Bryant. And we would hire someone in the city and then we would pay for other additional capacity like energy assessors to come on board. And every person would get this assessment and that puts them in the queue for an A20 rebate or incentive. And we learned this from our peers outside of uh, Michigan who have, they run programs like this, like in Colorado, Denver, Boulder, Aspen, they have rebate programs like this. And what they realized is uh, people go for the big ticket. Right. I can get the majority rebate on this thing, but that may not be what they need. John may not need a heat pump today because he just got a high efficiency system, but he really needs a dryer. Right. But the dryer rebate is less because the dryer costs less than the heat pump. So he may be inclined to go for a high rebate. Well, we don't want to do that. Right. We want we want John to have a strategy to decarbonize his home that is different than what Peck's strategy looks like, because Peck's home is different than John's home. And my business is different than your business. So we first want to create people or work with people to create their own decarbonization roadmap. Then they're eligible for the incentives. But I'm sort of, I know I took it in a different direction. I'll get to VPA in a second, but I want to name that's the largest source of funding for the millage is getting people rebates. Second is infrastructure. And that's on-site renewables. That's things like setting up for recycling. You, you can't just recycle or compost. We've got to buy the trucks and the equipment, right? Like in, in the early years. So we have that infrastructure that's in play. And then there are policy kind of initiatives. And I put like the VPPA sort of in there. It's a, it's a contract that we would have. If that goes forward, 
then it gives us the opportunity to go to the market and say, we want brand new renewables. We want them in Michigan. We want them with certain labor standards. Basically take the energy principles and criteria and we say, we want as many of these as you can give us. Now bid, right? So it's not a wreck. It is not going out and buying like whatever already exists because we have said we want new. We want additional and we want it here. So we would put out a contract for a firm to bid that. Now, why it is virtual is because those electrons do not go from wherever they are built directly to Ann Arbor. They go into the grid, right? So that's what makes it virtual. Helpful? Misty, I have a question, if I may, to follow up on that. Um, when the millage uh, was conceived, I don't know that the IRA was uh, necessarily foreseen. And so we had a two-year budget. And um, some of the things that you talked about, the assessments and the incentives, incentives, I think, have been talked about for quite a long time. But mm -hmm. um, is are we interpreting, in other words, some of the line items in the budget fairly broadly, which I think is a good idea to enable us to do some of the right things. That's what I'm sort of hearing from you. Yeah. Yeah. Like a rebate. So we're leaving it intentionally open because we also need to see what comes out from the state so we can stack those rebates so people go, go, can go further faster and more people can come in to making the kinds of actions that we want. Um, you can imagine low-income programs. We might be able to take low-income households pretty far in doing this work, whereas um, the IRA gets some people in, but for others, it's still it's just still too high of a bar to hit. And so we are going to be flexible. And what I like about candidly doing these, um, we need to come up with a name. So if anyone's really creative, I call it the A20 decarbonization assessment, which is terrible naming. But if if we do those, right, and and you you apply and get this free assessment, it helps not only you get your own kind of roadmap, but it tells me where we have the most opportunity in the market right now. It tells me that the majority of our money actually needs to go to range replacements because we have really terrible indoor air quality, right? And so it allows us to be really purposeful in where we put those dollars to have the largest impact, both in terms of climate and in terms of public health. Commissioner, commissioners. I, I, I have a few things jotted down, like I said, from emails and um, some both from commissioners and people outside the commission, but let's take commissioner questions or comments first. So I want to say thank you very much for that explanation. It really helped me. Oh, thank you. It's a complicated question. The energy system is very complex. That's why we're here. Yeah. And we don't run it one thing. Yeah. You all run it everything. So <laughs> it's muddled. Um, Missy, maybe one question, because you touched on it already, while other people think about what they may want to pose. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, the landfill solar. Um, could you give um, something to confirm or maybe put a different uh, light on what was already um, expressed here through public comment and what other people may have already heard? Uh, about which, can you just- Land, Landfill solar? Like project. where we are in it or? Yeah, I mean, I, you and I have exchanged information, um, but I don't know that it's been shared with the commission as a whole. Yeah. Joe mentioned something yeah. very briefly. Um, I'm just opening the door up for others to ask questions on about that or you, for you to give a little bit more detail. Sure, yeah, of course. So the landfill solar project is still on hold. We are right now looking at some funding opportunities. We're waiting that there's a really strategic opportunity from the state. We're waiting for the governor to release uh, the request for proposals on it. As soon as it goes live, we'll evaluate and hopefully apply. We have already identified um, or started talking to people about the project we have. It's a specific funding proposal for redevelopment of landfills. And you can't really do a lot on a landfill, but you sure as heck can do some solar on a landfill. Um, and that's what's sort of holding it up. At this point, if that falls through, I will terminate the project almost certainly because we can't make the economics work on our own. Other commissioners? Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Smith. 
Yes, thank you. Um, just curious, uh, it occurred to me, um, you know, is, do we think that, um, or I should say, have we thought about the opportunity to potentially um, partner um, or kind of leverage uh, the free home energy consultation services that are provided um, to, to DT? Do we see any uh, kind of synergies there that uh, we can capitalize on? Thank you for the question, because I realized I didn't clarify. Um, yes, Ish. So what the this A20 decarbonization assessment that we're talking about is a, tr a true decarbonization assessment. So it's energy efficiency opportunities as well as electrification, on-site renewable energy potential, and air quality, indoor air quality opportunities for improvement. Most energy assessments do not go that far, right? They're really looking at efficiency, and sometimes a really good one is also looking at air quality. We don't... Um, because our goal is so aggressive, we are trying to stack, right, in that moment to figure out how we do these things together and go as far fast as possible, which means we're working instead of kind of using someone else's system, we're creating our own and then asking folks to come with us in our community to, to actually implement that. So we'll be providing it for free, um, but folks are still welcome to use any service that's available. Um, it's just our rebates are more than just efficiency. And so we need to understand on-site renewable potential, electrification potential in order to make really smart choices with those limited dollars. Um, and 7 million is a lot of money, but it's sure as heck not enough for every household. So we've, we've got to be a little bit more surgical. Yeah, that's very helpful insights. And just curious, even if we think about kind of the lead generation process, is there opportunity mm -hmm. to kind of leverage that or kind of, you know, cross share knowledge of these are the folks that are interested, let's get in, right. um, you know, uh, let's layer on top of a home energy consultation, because we can go deeper on um, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. We've been talking to our friends at weatherization about a very similar thing, right? If you're getting in for weatherization, you're getting an assessment. Weatherization also comes with dollars. Um, right now, weatherization's wait list is really long. Um, so that's a like we're trying to work through that. It's about a two-year wait list here in Washtenaw County. That's just that's just too long for people to wait, especially low-income older adults uh, to wait for programs. So we're working with them to try to figure out how do we maybe not jump the queue, but how do we work collaboratively in this landscape? Because the other challenge I see. I could cannibalize their contractors. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Harper. Thank you so much. Um, I, was, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how you are um, thinking about particularly, I'm queuing a little bit on the second pre presentation, but how are you thinking about engagement and strategic communications across all of the programs? And I'm looking at slide number 10, for example, of other uses, public engagement and education, program administration, um, capacity building, and things like that. And how you're, how you're thinking about communications and engagement on, on one hand, but also with respect to the separate programs and whether that's sort of a separate, you know, communications engagement is a sort of separate, its own, piece or how it's integrated into the specific programs themselves in ways that um, provide sort of authentic and impactful engagement across across the program. Thank you for the really thoughtful question. And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, and I get to the point where you said, are you thinking about kind of engagement broadly? Or are you thinking about it in, in the individual programs? And that's where the answer is yes and yes, right? That there are um, Taking a step back structurally, the office can't look like the office has looked before as we launch all of these different initiatives. And so one of the things that I'm toying with is creating a community engagement unit in the office that's very, very focused on customizing like what the experience is like to do community engagement across the board. But everyone running a program and initiative has to do community engagement, right? It's, it's inherently part of the ethos of what we do in OSI. So that's not going to stop. Um, what is probably going to look a little... Well, I don't know that it'll look different because it's it's what we're doing now um, with one caveat. We have historically had a lot of really big tent conversations. We're going to keep having some of those, like our sustainability forums, our A20 week, big community town halls and some um, ideas. We are also going to start spending a lot more time in really deep kind of neighborhood work, especially with frontline populations, because it takes a really long time to build trust and rapport and get that work done. And that's, for example, what we've been doing in Bryant. We, we spend a lot of, kind of engaging in Bryant. And that's right. I think that's right. I would say based on the values of A20, that, that is what we should be doing. So you're going to see the reason we're trying to scale up or capacity up in that space is so we can have more folks go to Peace Neighborhood Center, 
and spend deep time there with them because we're working on a resilience hub with them. And Bonnie is a trusted, incredible broker in our community. And we need to make sure that Bonnie can function. And what about working with Derek at other sites? And what about working with Jen and Aubrey at the Housing Commission sites? You know, we need to go deep in places, in certain places, and use trusted brokers to do that. So yes and yes is the answer. And we do anticipate hiring someone to lead kind of neighborhood place-based engagement. Mr. Peck. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Hi, Missy. I, you know, I, so I personally do value virtual PPAs and understand their utility um, when they can displace renewable energy. And I believe they will displace renewable energy um, as a less expensive source of electricity than uh, the fossil fueled ones. Um, and I also believe that we're, we're not building renewable energy nearly at the rate is necessary to meet goals such as ours or, um, you know, the Paris Agreement or President Biden's, basically any of them. We're not building renewable energy quick enough. So whatever Ann Arbor can do to do that sort of implicitly will address the additionality issue. But I just wouldn't mind hearing you say it in your own words. Um, how that is um, so that some of the folks who called in, for example, can understand uh, why this is virtuous for Ann Arbor to invest in these. I, and I, I get a get the feeling a big part of this too is that to get the really low cost renewable energy on the grid that is necessary, we just don't have the options in Ann Arbor. And that's one of the reasons you're, you know, we're, looking to invest in this way. Am I getting it right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's a really complicated, it's it's complicated and it's not complicated. So let me take it from this perspective and Peck, please challenge and like ask me to like further elaborate if I miss where you want me to go. We are not looking at one thing. And, and I hope people know that, especially let's let's stick with energy and on and renewable energy. We are talking about incentives so people can put renewables on their home and on their business in this community right now. Right. We are actually, um, I don't know if you know this, but when the University of Michigan released their RFP for 25 megawatts of solar, we worked with them and released a parallel RFP for one megawatt of solar at city facilities. We work together on language. I mean, that, that is a big deal. That may not feel like it, but that's the most I've ever done with the university in that space. Like, that's great. So we're looking to deploy more renewables. We're breaking ground on the four, four and a half renewables that we're putting in the community. I'm still committed to the landfill solar project, which would bring 20 more, you know, megawatts of renewables into our system. So like we are looking at deployment locally. We are studying that SEU. We are studying the different options available to us. So like that is not dead. That is still going. And yet we have more demand for energy than what we have on the grid today and then what we'll have available in our community by 2030. And we have a goal. So we can also invest in brand new renewables in our grid, maybe not in our geographical boundary, but real close or somewhere in the system that displace fossil fuels and fundamentally switch the system. That we could invest in the My Green Power program. We could buy racks. Like those are also pathways. But the VPPA is a step up, at least the way we've been thinking about it. And the, because we set the energy criteria in principle, it's not rogue. We have links that we have to report in when we bring recommendations forward. And that's why it, I'm not nervous about a VPPA. That's why I think actually we can use affordable renewable energy and just snowball more renewable energy into the system. So I, I think it's a I think it's a tool in our toolbox. And I think and there's I a think time to place. Point out, I, I thank you for doing that. That DTE or, you know, they're not an energy developer, but they can, yeah, uh, they can bid on it too. If they want us to try and utilize one of their um, vehicles for getting that energy on the grid. Um, but it's not going to be the cheapest way to it's do not. it. I mean, and almost part, of, part of the way we make our, the energy we invest in, um, additional is by making it very inexpensive relative to the fossil fuel options. <coughs> Thank you, Pat, for the question. 
Others? Uh, Commissioner Zittleman. Yeah, thank you, Missy. I just wanted to ask a little bit of clarification on the landfill solar. So say it doesn't go through with DTE, it doesn't work out. Have we like actually studied the financial feasibility of doing it on our own? And like, like why would it just automatically be shut down as a yeah. project? If we can't do it with DT. There's a few reasons. That's a good question. And thank you for asking the further clarification. Number one, if we don't do it with DT, we're back at the end of the line. We have to redo all of the studies because we assumed we were using their infrastructure. So we are years back, right? So so one, there's an opportunity cost, right? Of pulling that trigger. That means that I, I have, with our limited capacity, is that the project? Like I, there's a real serious calculus that has to happen. Are we gonna go back into the queue or are we gonna use our time and resources another way? That's one. Two, while the IRA helps us uh, in terms of like lowering getting that, that rebate for the cost, it is still a very, inflation hurt us. And the Department of Commerce investigation hurt solar. And so the price tag on this, while it was never, it, we were not fully locked in at the moment, it went up significantly. And so the IRA helps buy part of that down, but the cost of the asset is still whatever it is. So I'm gonna try to do this visually. Uh, if we imagine this is what it cost, right? And the IRA brings us 30% in, that's great. You still have to depreciate an asset at this cost. You still have to have a replacement cost at this cost, right? So the IRA helps you in this part, but I still have to financially make sure that I am building my books to cover the full replacement of that asset. So it's not actually as cheap as 30% cheaper. Yeah. And then it becomes very seriously becomes a calculus. So we, we've done some behind the like preliminary numbers because we don't have final costing because the market moved really fast when we were, for those who weren't with us, just so you know, we were there, right? This body took up the resolution to move landfill solar forward. The next step was going to council to sign the contract. We didn't do anything wrong. No one on this call did anything wrong. The world moved around us and we're victims of that. And so we're trying to navigate that landscape. I just want to be transparent. This isn't this isn't nefarious. This isn't nothing malicious here. It's just bad timing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Peck, did you have another question? No, you're good. Yes. Um, oh, go ahead, yeah. Um, what I'm interested in, in my other my another question is the world moves around us as missy you just said is there any i want to move as quickly you know obviously ann arbor has an audacious goal we got to move as fast as we can to displace fossil fuel that's what you're doing uh, and we're trying to help you do that um but with uh the change in the political situation in michigan is there any chance uh good chance that the situation will, the world will move around us again, that could make mm -hmm. other options, uh, investment options, a, a lot more attractive. And as I don't want to wait for that to happen if it's, you know, low probability, but I'm just wondering, um, you know, because DT is obviously not, tr is trying to do whatever they can to slow things down. And I'm, I know that people in Lansing are thinking about ways to speed things up. Any in, intel or insight there? Yeah, I think people on the line might actually even know more time sensitive information than I do. Of course, last week we saw community solar legislation introduced. That's a that's a big deal, um, but it is not a given that that is going to pass, even in a Democratic legislature. So it is important that we make our voices heard on that. Um, we have listening sessions from the public. That's that's in you know thinking Lansing, but we've got the public service commissioners, and we don't have that much longer with our three sitting commissioners, and they are very serious about this work, and they're going on a listening tour about the recent outages. They'll be in Jackson and Dearborn on the twentieth, and then they're doing a virtual listening session on the 21st. We did invite them to Ann Arbor um, and we'll see if, if they stand up a separate event. But th this is this is sort of a moment where I think we have attention on the issues, but it's I don't think we should take for granted that it's just going to happen because the stars aligned. I think it's going to take some continued pushing to get folks to, 
pass the legislation, hold the accountability accountability principles, do the do the work that we all think we want. Uh, I'm going to ask a question, if I may, because it related to the same landfill solar or make maybe a, a statement that you can respond to. Um, not having looked ever in detail at a pro forma for the project, I think what a lot of people don't understand relative to the financials, and I don't, as I understand it, nothing that's currently proposed at the state level is going to change the financials. Mm. It may change, like you said, um, community solar and things like that may give us some options, but it's not going to change the financials. So recognizing that landfill solar is a little bit more difficult because um, it, you're sitting on top of a landfill and you can't make penetrations and things like that. But um, I think the, the question that probably a lot of people have that I still have in my head is if there are record levels of solar being installed across the nation and across the world, why is it that this project financially isn't working while all these other ones are seemingly being able to go forward. And I don't know if recently uh, OSI has asked, for example, Commissioner Kerber or former Commissioner Chuck Hookham to look at the financials again and see if there's anything that might have changed. So I, I think that's probably the people that I talk to, that's a lingering question in their head. What is so unique about this project that others are going forward that this one isn't? Well, if you if you point out uh, some landfill solar projects that are making good money at a large, like at the size that we're talking about, I would love to see them because okay. we are getting recognition for having one of the largest landfill, well, for a minute, the largest landfill solar project in America. Mm -hmm. Landfill is ex landfills are expensive. They're challenging to build on, and it's our largest source of land. And so we pushed it, um, and we we knew we would. It was going to be a premium project. It it was going to be a premium. It costs more. You can't penetrate. Um, there are environmental species we have to protect for. There's seasonality of when we can be in the ground and when we can't be in the ground. We've got to watch for contaminants. We got to make sure we can still get in because it's. The landfill is settling, right? Methane is still coming out. So we have all of these, um, I don't know what the proper term is. I do somewhere in my mind, uh, but they're uh, they're not vents, but it, it effectively, right? The, the methane can't build up and explode on site. So there, there's mechanisms, I'm way out of my league here, but they're the system itself. We have to be able to monitor the system and get on site. So we can't just blanket it, right? And so there's all of these design features that you have to mitigate for, which are good. That's good, right? We don't want anything bad happening at this landfill. We don't want to break the cap. But that means it's not a green field, right? Like it's not a normal build where you just go in and you put right. solar as far as the eye can see. Right. You have to design around that. You have to engineer around that. And that just, that takes customization and that takes cost. Customization is cost. So that's part of the reason. And by, boy, oh boy, um, the permitting process has been really hard. You know, there. I say this sort of in joke in jest, but it wasn't in the moment. We had to search for a species that was last seen on site in 1902. Mm -hmm. Like we had to send people to look for it, right? And and we didn't find it. It's not there, but it delayed everything because then if it was, we had to do different mitigation techniques. And so like the time and effort that goes in and you don't, some of these assessments are only good for two or three years and then you've got to reassess. So you incur a lot of costs and part of this project, like it is a, it was a labor of pain and love for me is working with the state at every step to say, we need to change this. You're making it too hard. I know the governor wants to see more of these developments. We are going to fight through this because we're going to be stubborn. But you you got to sit beside us and help us change the code, change the regulation, change the permitting process. Mm -hmm. And that's perhaps. Great. Thanks. That's Thanks. That adds a lot of expense too, John. Yeah. yeah. I mean, some of that is some cost, but obviously some of it is not. It's reflected in the execution cost. So that's clear. Yeah. Commissioner, Commissioner Levin. Uh, yeah, I understand you're still, you know, working on the solar project, but um, is there a thought to what, where the money would go if that doesn't happen? I mean, is that possibly where it could be a VPPA kind of thing? Or I know it's early, so maybe you don't even know. But. Yeah, it's a fair question. So one thing I'd share is the city does not have a line item budget, right? In, in that, um, I'll say... 
John, John kind of called me out in, in on this and the rebates, like being intentionally vague so I could see what people need, right? The same is true for that particular line item. If what we discover is that the rebates are wildly effective and we are seeing emissions be like just dropping and this is the right vehicle, I can actually make the call that we're not going to fund something else in there and put more money towards the most effective thing. So I don't know how to answer your question exactly where the money would go in that sense. All I can tell you is that we're, we are always looking at multiple things. We have way more projects than we have money for. Um, we're always fundraising. That money might be directed towards a sustainable energy utility, you know, and standing up the preliminary cost of it. Or that money might go uh, to finish the net zero energy fire station because we're close, but we haven't yet closed the delta to get that over the hoop uh, or over the loop. It might go for match for our next electric refuse truck in the system. You know, like, so I'm holding it for landfill solar, but if landfill solar does not materialize, we will use that money to affect emissions. Other comments, questions? I'm gonna rattle off several and they're really more just for uh, people. Uh, Commissioner or Council Member Briggs, go ahead. Your last statement, um, Dr. Stoltz just made me, raised a question for me in terms of, you know, thinking about how additional funds might be able to be used and obviously they're going to be used strategically to try to advance <laughs> our the goals of our plan um in alignment with what the voters um uh allocated mm -hmm. or sort of promised in passing the millage but um is there uh what's happening behind the scenes i guess to help identify um there's there's always going to be gaps. There's always going to be more funding that we need, but to identify that um, it is directed towards the projects that are going to end up delivering, you know, impacting our emissions, um, lowering our emissions the most. I mean, it, as opposed to sort of what's maybe the greatest need at the moment to move a project forward. There are a handful of variables. Uh, it, it is not a secret sauce of one thing to be honest, right? We have A20, so we already know where we need to make investments and that is an incredible directive. We also have things that this body has talked about that aren't in A20. We don't have an SEU, right, in A20, but that doesn't mean we're not working on that. We don't have telework in A20 because we evaluated it and it didn't make the cut, but we were wrong, right? Uh, the pandemic showed us we were wrong. So A20 is like the North Star, but the the mother metric is greenhouse gas emissions reductions. That, however, is also guided by equity. So we look for the things that have the highest impact, but we also have to hold space for the things that are gonna take a lot of time, right? If we eat all the low hanging fruit, we don't leave. If, we, if we're never working on the harder things, we're never building momentum towards them. And so we're trying to simultaneously build the movement and the systems to do the really hard systems change work that will be the most transformative that we do while we're also getting these wins in the system, right? So the, the things that we evaluate are obviously cost per greenhouse gas reduction that we can get, public willingness to engage in an initiative, because it won't matter if theoretically I get a high ROI on it, but no one does it, right? So we, we've got to build in, um, is the public ready? What do we have to do to get them ready, right? Those public engagement dollars may not be much. There may be only 50,000 in the budget, but they may be the most important 50,000 that we spend, right? Depending on kind of what that individual action and strategy is. Um, and then there is, there is certainly opportunism that comes into play. I, I would be lying if I told you that wasn't true, right? The Department of Energy released a geothermal grant. I went for it. We have money in the budget for a geothermal study. If I win the federal government grant, I'm not going to put it towards, I'm, I, I freed up dollars over here that I'll reallocate, right? Because I'm able to use federal dollars. So there's opportunity that we, we also bring into the equation. Thanks for the question. So as I mentioned, because it's uh, time is ticking here and we've got uh, Michelle waiting and we've got a couple of other things to, to deal with. I'm just going to rattle off a couple of things. And um, I think really some of these uh, you don't need to respond to. 
Um, so first of all, um, I'm just going to state one thing, Missy, that you and I have corresponded on, but it was also posed as a question to me, and that was, um, if there are issues that arise and are seem likely to arise that will require additional legal resources, um, that was not a specific line item that was called out in the two-year budget, but um, it's my understanding that there is at least an understanding or a provision that that will be uh, money will be spent for that because that advances particular causes. It just may not have been tied to legal fees. So um, that I think uh, everybody on the commission deserves, deserves to know that, and that that's welcome news. Um, a lot of people, myself included, are concerned um, about, um, for example, well, so I'll say generally spending money on what seems to be. Um, high-hanging fruit as opposed to low-hanging fruit, particularly from the perspective of dollars per um, metric ton of CO2 em um, emitted reduced. And one of the categories where that is, is that I, as um, in solid waste or um, um, circular economy, I think we all recognize the need to um, reduce scope three emissions, but at least the calculations that were done at the time um, indicate that those are among the least effective um, and we don't even have data that at least the Environmental Commission has seen yet that shows, for example, was organics collection, year-round organics collection effective at all? Did tonnage go up at all? Did our diversion rate decrease? So before we spend lots and lots of money on those things um, that we aren't sure really are going to have a significant impact and in fact may even have offsetting emissions because we have trucks running around, that I think it's really important that um, staff and council examine those items and spend the money where we have low hanging fruit, where we know if we spend um, a dollar, for example, on energy efficiency measures, or we incentivize those kinds of uh, actions that we know we're gonna get a really, really good payback on that. And that maybe some of the higher hanging fruits are things that we do later down the road. I'm just gonna continue. Um, someone wrote me and asked about um, millage funds, um, potentially being devoted to either incent developers to build without natural gas or to um, build more high efficiency or uh, high efficiency new construction. Um, that was something that was thrown out there. I think that personally, that's that's a, 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 a two, two, uh, two bladed sword where on the one hand, it could do good. On the other hand, it may incent every single developer to come to the city and say, hey, please for, pay for my all electric, uh, whatever it is, or please pay for my um, better envelope. So there, there are people that are asking those kinds of questions. Um, I think that's it. And I'm really just asking that uh, those those issues be considered and, and debated when yeah. budget is is reviewed. I appreciate that. And I'm not going to hammer them in detail, but I want to say uh, you brought up some things that I had hoped to say and that they just evaded me. One is uh, OSI is asking for an attorney in the attorney's office. Uh, so we are asking for full-time capacity because we, the way we, this is a further conversation, but the way our attorneys are structured is they sort of are appointed to service areas and we don't have someone. So we always get in at the end of the line. And that's, that's part of what we're looking at. And then we have external uh, professional services dollars if we need more or a different kind of attorney. So yes, um, thank you for naming that. Uh, high hanging fruit. Sure. Um, what I would say is we know that we undercalculated the life cycle emissions associated with with waste and the circular economy because there is not a standard methodology, but we are on the team helping create the standard methodology for what it looks like to capture those emissions. So I would say maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe that's not true when we really understand the true emissions associated with things uh, like solid waste. Also solid waste is sort of a gateway. Uh, it's very personal and people come into the field from it. So I wouldn't totally uh, take that off the table uh, in terms of importance, but to your other points about justification of impact, I'm totally heard and understood. Yeah. Efficiency. I wish everyone did it. They don't. Uh, it's peas and carrots. We can't get people to do it. So instead, what we're doing is feeding it into the things they want to eat, like solar. They just love solar. So then we give them efficiency when they do solar. So we're yes and is what I would say to that. And then yeah. lastly, um, incenting developers. Interesting idea. Um, I would say our focus, most of the buildings that we're going to have are already here. So we're focusing more on incentives and rebates for our existing folks to make sure yeah. today's Ann Arbor rates get the benefit. Good, good. Thanks very much. Um, one last uh, opportunity for commissioners to weigh in. Going, going, gone. Michelle, you're next. My turn? Your turn. 
Okay. Good evening, commissioners. Thanks for giving me some time this meeting to go over the equitable engagement initiative. Let me make sure first you all can see my screen. Yes. Okay, great. And, and thanks to Missy again. Missy, you're welcome to stay, um, but we also understand if you need to go. So go ahead, Michelle. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, my name is Michelle Bennett. I'm a community engagement specialist with the city um, in the systems planning unit. So that is um, separate from OSI, but um, there are a few of us with this title that do this work at the city. And in full transparency, I did not start this project. Um, my former colleague, Heather Seifarth and um, Missy Stoltz really got this off the ground. Um, but I am here to help wrap it up um, as Heather's moved on to uh, the Housing Commission. So as part of the, the project wrap up, we are taking it around to different commissions to give an overview of what um, this initiative entailed and some of the, the highlights and findings. So to start, the project's broad aim here was to define what equity means. Uh, we did this with a steering committee, and I'll get into the details of how they were selected. But this really was kind of a ground up um, process where they defined what equity means. And we spent a lot of time discussing not only what the definition would be, but how that could be incorporated into the city's policies, guidelines, and practices so that we could create a more inclusive engagement process. So before we started, the staff did quite a bit of pre-work. Um, starting in fiscal year 2019, we started collecting demographic data through our surveys and um, public engagement events um, in person and virtually. These graphs here only show the, the survey respondents um, and they are compared to the census data with well, the 2021 uh, estimates. And I think that this confirmed largely what we already knew in that most of our attendees are um, white, wealthier, um, empty nesters or retirees that own their own homes. And so in comparing the, that data to the, to the census, we can see where we're lacking certain representation, right? Definitely in the renting group, definitely in the younger age categories, um, ethnic diversity is really lacking, racial and ethnic diversity. And you can see here where the, the incomes are sort of concentrated here in the higher brackets. Um, as a part of our pre-work, we also looked at promising practices from other communities, our own practices, and then did a little research on some of the local, and by regional, we mean mainly Washtenaw County um, conditions, kind of documentation reports that are related to, to equity. So this is kind of our existing conditions research. As a part of our current practices, we have an engagement toolkit, and that is something that is asked of project managers to go through with a community engagement specialist. So we can discuss, you know, what stakeholders do we need at the table? What's the what's the best um, process and engagement techniques for our desired outcome for, for specific projects. So that's something that's already in place and actually is right now uh, being updated. The demographic collection I just shared with you, we started doing that to get an idea of who we're reaching through our engagement efforts. Um, we also work with the International Association of Public Participation. They're a nonprofit with a global reach that's dedicated to public participation. So they um, came, this was right before the pandemic, and trained about 50 staff members um, on best practices for, for engagement. We've also worked with the youth pre-pandemic that we're hoping to um, start again, but that's really explaining to them what the civic pro process is, how they can get involved, and get them to start critically thinking about, you know, the outcomes of engagement and how it should be done. And then this is outside of systems planning. I think this is mainly through pl um, the planning and development, but there is an ordinance on file that requires developers with new development to, to do some public engagement. 
So this was also thrown up right before the pandemic as everything was switching virtually. They um, created a, a hub, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about later. Um, but we have seen actually through research done by the University of Michigan School of Information students that it's not heavily uh, visited, as you can see here by these visits per month. And then it also doesn't direct you to all the engagement opportunities that are available. And this is partly because of how things are organized on the city side, um, that we all have our own departments and it has not yet been all funneled into one page. So you have to find information about engagement by project page that could be scattered across the website. So meanwhile, uh, while we were doing some of this pre-work, we were also putting out um, these kind of flyers around the city that were really strategically thought about um, how we can um, reach out to these groups that are not well represented. So in that call, we got about 80 applicants um, and 30 members were selected to be on the steering committee. And they were tasked with meeting monthly uh, for about 18 months. And as I mentioned, they were defining what equity means, what our core values are. And ultimately through these discussions, um, developing recommendations to uh, take to council. So here's their definition of equity. Um, you can see this is a big conversation now as equity versus equality. The idea here is that you can see in the graphic here on the right, that giving everyone the same exact resource does not necessarily lead to um, equal outcomes or everyone thriving, right? So if you can see on the bottom there that everyone needs a different style bike in order to ride safely. And so that's kind of the direction we're moving in in terms of equity is that if we, if our standard processes are getting us the same types of attendees that I shared in the demographics, that we need to put more time and effort into um, engagement and outreach so that we can get a more representative uh, group to attend. So here's some of the topics that were covered over those 18, uh, 18 months. You can see it's quite a range here. And I will say this third to last bullet point came up quite a bit. And uh, some of our recommendations actually veered a little bit I would say maybe on the fringe of what we would consider to be engagement, but still very important. Um, and so I will get into that in the first recommendation. Um, so we created this little paw um, for a five um, toed animal that we're not really sure what it would be. But the idea was as we took notes, as we listened over these 18 months, these were the five topics that kept coming up. Um, and we were happy to discuss them because as we know, equity touches everything. And so what we tried to make here at the PAW, at the center of all of your discussions is how can community engagement establish an equitable footing on all of these topics? So again, just trying to bring everything back to how the process and how to make sure that our processes are equitable. So towards the end of that 18 months, they, the steering committee came up with um, recommendations and I'm gonna go through those briefly uh, or pr pretty quickly, but I'm happy to take questions on those afterwards. This is really the crux of, the, of me coming here tonight is so that we can hear your feedback or any thoughts or questions you have on these recommendations. So the first one, and again, these are all in the words of the steering committee members. Um, demonstrate the city's committed to advancing equity. Um, here's where they really want to see uh, accountability and where you can see that the city's hiring practices come into play. Um, they were saying before you even get into your engagement series, you have to understand that people don't feel comfortable attending these events if the city staff does not reflect you know, the demographics of the city. Um, and so we had HR on a lot of our calls to talk about these things. Um, but you can see here that they wanted pathways created for um, mainly BIPOC was the, the main conversation we had about that, of how to get them into staff and into leadership positions and, you know, ideally running these kind of engagement sessions um, to attract and build trust with um, 
the people of these groups. They also want to see um, policies adopted and enforced by city council. And they stressed a lot of being authentic. And that came across in several ways of being straightforward, being to the point, being honest, not using jargon, um, using language that you know everyone can understand and where people feel comfortable asking questions um, was a big part of how they want to see engagement change. Okay, the second recommendation here, provide ample, ample and targeted invitations to engagement opportunities. So this is um, recommendations uh, about our outreach as well. There was a lot of emphasis on using non-digital means, so really getting out into the community. And this touches on what, what Missy was saying as well and the direction we wanna move in, is they really want us to be on the ground, meeting people face-to-face, -face, putting flyers in their businesses, talking to business owners, um, not just throwing a link up on the, the city's calendar. Um, they want, you know, materials translated for our non-native English speaking folks. Um, and they do, if we are going to stick to some things online, which of course we have to, they want, they wanted an engagement hub, uh, uh, an improvement to what we have now. So I'm going to talk more about that later. The third recommendation here is kind of really saying, put your money where your mouth is. If you care about equity, then you need to dedicate resources for staff and training. So they wanna make sure there is money in the budget to um, hire more people or have more staff there and make sure that they're constantly keeping up to date on new practices through training. So in terms of what we already do, that would mean probably working with the International Association of Public Participation more. Um, and creating metrics and milestones um, for us to, to follow and to meet. And to come up with those takes a team and to hold each other accountable takes a team. And then this is the last set of recommendations to make engagement events more accessible and attractive. Um, so this is kind of asking us to maybe branch out of some of our um, standard practices. So holding hybrid meetings, which is possible in this setting, but when you wanna do exercises with the community, having people in person and online, we have not nailed that yet. We are still working that out in certain locations. Um, they want it to be structured in such a way that um, we mitigate grandstanding, that we have rules that we enforce, um, that keep the environment respectful. Um, and that again, going to this being authentic of really communicating what's the decision, what's the process, who's making the decision and what level of influence do we have? So those kinds of questions for number five are in the toolkit that I mentioned. We do discuss those at the beginning, but they mentioned that there's definitely room for improvement there. So I went through quite a bit of material in a short amount of time. I know you guys have a busy agenda. So um, let me just touch on a couple more things. Um, when we researched promising practices, the engagement hub came up over and over again. We've done some research on that and have put in a budget request. And so I have an example here of what one looks like for the city of Pittsburgh. Um, this has different project cards all centralized across all departments onto one landing page. It allows users to um, select projects based on category type or location so that they can customize this page to their interests or to their neighborhood. And then when you click on a project card, it would provide all the engagement opportunities available to you along with who the final decision maker is, what the timeline is, um, a much more transparent process um, than what we currently do have. Although we do provide a that, lot of that information, like I mentioned, it's pretty scattered and it would be hard for some people to find. So that's uh, hopefully something we'll find out if we get the funding for that in the next couple of months and would be one of the bigger projects that we uh, plan to pursue. So I will end there just letting you all know that um, if you go to this link, there are more project details. There's also the draft report um, that explains everything I discussed in greater detail. And if you have any other thoughts or questions after this evening, then you can email this email address. Um, 
Heather and I both have access to that and can respond to you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, before I recognize you, Commissioner McKenna, um, Joe, could you put one thing in the meeting minutes as an assignment for you, me, and Carlene to look at the recommendations from this and see how we might be able to apply those specifically to the work and meetings of the Energy Commission? Um, yep. I think that's one thing that we should definitely act on. Um, and while I have the floor, I'm just going to say one other thing real quickly, um, and that is, um, it's really more a question, I guess, to Commissioner Peck, and I'm wondering, you know, the city is do updating its comprehensive plan, and the university is updating its master plan, and those are going to be hugely consequential for the city, um, and I'm wondering if the university is equally attuned to um, some of these inequities in how information is being gathered and who is there to provide it to make sure that um, these these really significant planning activities are really going to be reflective of the true needs and desires of the whole diverse community that we live in. Do you know if, if the university is attuned to the to, like what we saw those 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 bar charts where you know there were certain communities that were just basically left entirely out of the process? Yeah, I mean the the community that we're working with, <clears throat> I think you know it's not really super clear yet exactly what we're doing. Um, you know, in other words, we're sort of planning the process as we go. Uh, it's like learning to fly a plane while you're starting to fly. Um, I think because we've got it. You know, the president wants to do it very quickly, and I and I applaud him for that. You know, there are a lot of things like climate action that just can't sit around and wait for two years to figure it out what we're going to do. But um, we're really focused on the university community. Uh, you're talking about our master planning um, and not as much our visioning. Uh, and I think that effort, we're not going to use the term master, by the way, yeah. which is indicative that we are a little aware of equity, yeah. uh, <laughs> is... Um, you know, that will involve reaching out to adjacent uh, communities and, and really understanding how the University of Michigan can operate not just on its own property, but in collaboration with those other entities around us um, in a more effective way. Uh, and so I would imagine this will be very important. And I wish I could tell you the answer. Um, you know, there will certainly be a focus on ensuring that what we do is equitable. But will it be successful? Um, you know, we still haven't proved our ability to do that. And it includes, like, for example, what we're doing in Detroit. Um, you know, we have to, I'm hoping we'll work very hard. And I, I really enjoyed this presentation because it, it made sense. You know, it's like, how, how do we engage? And maybe these... Uh, if I can send the copy of this, which I bet I can, because it's a public document, uh, to some of my colleagues, it might help. Thank you. Great. Commissioner McKenna. Thank you. Uh, hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, it's lovely to hear that, that there's quite a, a serious engagement um, process happening and, and concern for equity. Um, so as I think about some of the uh, agenda items upcoming, especially um, the resolution requesting um, the city administrator to engage on um, on equity um, and uh, with the uh, sorry the uh, Michigan Public Service Commission on our uh, access to utilities in our city, um, you know I'm just thinking about uh, kind of ongoing engagements with um, underrepresented groups, and I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about you know maybe spinning off of the work that you shared with us, what your intention is, or or how you kind of see the city continuing to do this work, and specifically you know what um, what actions are you going to take, um, you know around maybe keeping a group assembled or you know ensuring that there is. Um, because uh, I know uh, the effort that it takes to, you know, gather, um, so first of all, define equity and then, you know, gather a group and into a steering committee and then, you know, through a process of what, 18 months or whatever you said, um, kind of, uh, you know, work with them consistently to, to kind of get the information that you provided with us. But knowing that there will be ongoing issues and we have them, you know, ongoing currently. Yeah. What, what is the plan for, for keeping that um, equity? Yeah. Engagement? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So most of the community engagement, uh, I'll say at least in systems planning, is project-based, right? And so, you know, oftentimes if it's not happening right on your street, um, it's hard to get people to engage. And so one thing that we have been talking about, because the, the steering committee, the Equitable Engagement Steering Committee, there's several of them that um, want to remain active. Um, but this project is wrapping up, right? Because our engagement is is typically project based. So we are thinking of ways to extend that and to continue to work with them. One of the thoughts we've had is a community liaison program, and that's again getting at really stakeholder building, kind of on the ground um, of going to communities who may or may uh, not trust us or just not know the process, and working with liaison liaisons helping to train them to facilitate and work with those communities and maybe relay information back to us. Um, you know, also being more of service to them. So not just coming to them. This is what a committee member told me and it's really stuck with me. It's like, don't just come to us to ask things of us. Um, like an actual relationship is an exchange. So how can we be of service to them as well? Um, you know, how can we get involved in the work that they're doing where appropriate um, so that, you know, they are also likely to be more candid with us and participate with us um, and really build a partnership. So I would say that, you know, we're trying in a couple different ways to um, take their take their recommendations of being more on the ground. Um, Right now, it is just me. Heather has moved to another position. So as we hire someone else, that's one of the first things I want us to work on together is kind of stakeholder planning and being really strategic about what, um, you know, is it neighborhood groups, community centers? Is it religious institutions? Like, what, where are we going to go to spend more time to build to build these relationships? And how can we include the, the steering committee in this effort with us? So. Those are some of the things we're thinking about right now to extend this effort. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Uh, seeing none, Denny or Michelle, I should say, um, thanks for uh, spending part of your evening with us. And um, Everybody re re recall this is posted on Legistar and go back and refer to it. I think it should continue to inform our work. So thanks again very much. Yeah, thank you all. Have a great evening. Great. Okay, next point on their agenda um, are, uh, we have three resolutions. Um, the last is going to be a first reading, so I, I'm anticipating not a whole lot of discussion and that hopefully most of that will be then in the second reading. But um, the first is um, a resolution. Um, I'll give a little bit of background and then I'll let uh, Council Member Briggs and um, Missy uh, chime in if uh, appropriate. So this is a resolution that was considered uh, by Council uh, last Monday. Uh, it, um, Council Member Briggs brought it to my attention a couple of days ahead of time um, and asked if um, I had any input on it. I provided her some insights that I thought uh, potentially could improve uh, the uh, resolution. Uh, Council decided on Monday that they would defer action on it, refer it back to the Energy Commission for comment. Um, the intent tonight is not to vote on this resolution. Uh, the intent is not to wordsmith it. Um, the intent is to gather ideas that um, I'm gonna ask that um, Joe, um, you uh, do your best job to uh, make note of them. And um, also I assume that um, Council Member Briggs will do the same as will Missy. And the intent is, is that we get that back to Council um, as soon as possible for their consideration so that they can act on this on Monday. So um, their next meeting is Monday. Um, they want to act while the iron is hot, so to speak, or strike while the iron is hot. And that's our intent tonight. And Councilmember Riggs, please add to that or yeah. contradict me where appropriate. <laughs> 
Nope, that was perfect. I just will add to it a little bit. So um, yes, this was a, um, this the agenda item that we're talking about is um, one that was a resolution put forward by council member Ghazi Edwin, um, co-sponsored as well by council member Song and Harrison. And it is um, basically working to advance our um, energy equity and, um, and resilience. Um, it was in reaction, I think in, in part to what we, in large part to what we saw in our community um, following the um, these winter storms and sort of the performance of DPE in our area. And so you'll notice a lot of the whereas clauses are around that um, because of the um, desire to get this to the council table and have some public discussion around that. Um, it didn't come you know, immediately to energy commission, whereas we might sometimes see it go to Energy Commission and then to, to council and said it's gone to council and back here to Energy Commission. Um, but council member um, Radina and I had just wanted to make sure that folks had an opportunity to, there's a lot of knowledge on this commission, you know, take a look and see as in those resolve clause specifically, um, are there bullet points that may be missing in terms of things that we wanna call upon the legislature to do or the Michigan Public Services Commission to do. Um, we also obviously heard a number of commissioners um, talking about the resolve clause or number of members of the public talking about um, the resolve clause around DTE you know, coming to the commission. Um, so just welcoming some feedback. It can be tonight. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity to look at it, feel free to take a look at it after the meeting tomorrow. Um, we do want to bring it back to the Council for a final vote next Monday. So, um, you know, today is Tuesday. I would say maybe if you could get feedback to um, back through um, staff to us by Thursday, um, that would give the, the sponsor of this resolution the ability to reflect upon the feedback that the commission has provided. So, happy to answer questions or listen to feedback. Great. So um, I provided some things, but I'm going to let everybody else go and anything that uh, you guys don't mention, then I'll bring up at the end. Um, Commissioner McKenna, then Harp, and then Berkowitz. Yeah, hi, Councilmember Briggs. Thank you so much for uh, providing this for us. Um, it's a lot to talk about here, um, but um, I kind of want to keep it short and uh, maybe I can provide some more comments, uh, written comments. Um, number one, I'd just like to um, kind of bring our attention to the the idea of, of compensating folks for for lost um, food and um, you know whatever costs that may, may have been incurred due to relocating. Um, I think that's a great start, but I would want to encourage emphasis on um, equitable access to those resources. I don't know if this you know maybe belongs here, but I think a lot of the breakdown in equity in our infrastructure um, is you know while there may be attention paid to Creating more resources for um, for folks that 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 kind of suffer inequities or that um, that that may not have had the access um, that they needed, and you know, or who are disproportionately affected by these outages, um, you know, their ability to actually access those resources when they're made available um, actually becomes um, quite difficult. So I just wanted to add that. Um, I think additionally a point maybe for discussion that I'll that I'll pose um, is that I think the language around um, resilience and strengthening the wires network and, and some of the undergrounding efforts um, maybe isn't as strong as I'd like to see it. For instance, I see resolved um, that the um, Ann Arbor calls Michigan Public Service uh, Commission to hold DZ accountable by directing underground efforts. Um, I don't I don't understand what that means, um, you know, reading through this and, and being pretty knowledgeable in the field. And I, I frankly don't think that we're at the directing point anymore. Um, I want to see language as strong as passing legislation requiring, um, which I see above um, in terms of um, having the city be compensated for their losses. Um, so I just wanna talk about precedent uh, around language and those kinds of requirements um, and just, yeah, just emphasize that I think undergrounding is the very most important thing that needs to come out of this. Commissioner Hart. Thank you. I had a just a couple of comments. Um, when I was looking at, in, the, in the section around utility redlining, I, I was looking a little bit more to try to un unpack 
what that means more specifically and, and with a greater description and personal my reading it might relate to lower hosting capacity things like um, lower and uneven grid modernization um, outdating and increased age of production and distribution assets um, and things of those sites so it's as well as um, informational resources um, that might be available depending on different customers um, abilities to pay for those resources or or, or um, other areas so it's just just a, a closer look at that and what that might mean beyond just outdated assets um, and in a few areas I was wanting to draw attention just to the informational services that are available as well a number of uh, folks have mentioned not only the maps but also the ability to analyze bills and um, energy efficiency and use um, practices that they might be um, using not only through the website and the bill paying service but also um, in addition there's an app and an energy bridge tool that can be um, that one can rent effectively um, to provide an additional layer of information and so there's just a major difference between those informational resources in terms of not only how they're presented but what's presented on them and um, that can itself um, create certain inequities as well and availability of information um, so i just wanted to draw attention to that um, and the other there was one line associated um i think it was in the second section on resolved of just um asking the public service commission to hold dt accountable by um it was the second bullet point and proactive on issues of climate change i was wanting to better understand what what proactive around issues on climate change means in this in this context whether that's um adaptive you know, making more adaptive distribution or, or whether that's uh, improving um, renewables and uh, reducing fossil fuels in the energy mix or what that might be and more specifically. Do you want me to I answer? I think that was it. No, uh, those were just, uh, those are some of the comments I was, I was wanting to add to that. Yeah. And if anybody has, you know, specifics that then would enable that language to be fine tuned, please submit that in writing then. Right? Yes. We'll do. Writer. And Commissioner McKenna, that applies to anything you said too. If there's anything in detail, yep, that's great. Um, Commissioner Berkowitz. Thank you, everyone. I uh, really appreciate the conversation. Uh, topics near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, I just have a few things that I would suggest adding to the resolution to improve and strengthen it. Um, I've got some notes that I prepared right before we hopped onto the Zoom. So I will email that to Joe and the pertinent folks uh, when we're done talking or when, when I am done talking multitasking, but just to speak them into this meeting, um, uh, the line about undergrounding, I think would be strengthened by adding um, something about generalized grid hardening. I think that's the intent, or at least that's what I was getting at, or I think it, it's trying to get at the first half. So maybe grid hardening, I think could be a key term to strengthen that bullet. And then I have four things on my wish list that I think should be on the city's wish list for the legislature. Um, candidly, my comments are geared towards the legislature because I think the commission and the city administrator seem to be doing the most they can with like the limited resources and the enforcement and implementation like mechanisms and authority they have under state statute. So we got to just improve state statute potentially to open some of those things up. Um, the first thing is passing legislation to require performance-based rate making for utilities handled by the, the Public Service Commission or through the commission in like contested cases or dockets. This is just a best practice for holding utility companies accountable and essentially tying their financial compensation to reliability, affordability, whatever metrics you want, you know, equity, pollution reduction. <clears throat> um, and you can also create mechanisms for penalizing utility companies when they fail to meet these things, which is, I think, something, you know, we're all in agreement is quite missing right now. Another thing to name um, that I think is kind of like danced around in a couple of the bullets talking about resiliency, um, I would like to see the word microgrids added in. Um, microgrid is just like the technical term for when there is a portion of a grid that cannot operate like an island. Um, and, you know, one of the two of the bullets talk about like the essential services like hospitals, fire, police, you know, schools, shelters, nonprofits, um, having them 
be able to operate within their own microgrid can be really beneficial. It can, you know, also help out the grid even when there aren't power outages and just when there's peak demand on the hottest hours of the year or the coldest hours of the year, um, it can help shave demand for running gas or other fossil fuel powered peaker plants elsewhere on the grid and delivering benefits to impacted communities tangentially. So microgrids are a great option all around and currently are barred uh, by state statute for the most part. Sorry, two more things on the wish list. Um, one is a state establishing a statewide storage standard. Um, I actually just read um, that uh, State Representative Jen Hill uh, from the Upper Peninsula is working to introduce legislation on this right now, but essentially it would um, require utilities to invest in utility scale uh, storage. Um, I think the resolution talks about local small scale storage, um, the third bullet point in particular. Um, I think we should also push utility scale storage uh, because it just uh, largely helps insulate the entire grid. And not only in Arbor, but all of our brother and sister communities across the state um, to help us more systematically be insulated from extended outages over large periods of time. Um, and also delivers benefits to the grid, um, you know, displaces the need for running fossil fuel peaker plants, just like um, microgrids. Last item on the wish list. Um, and again, Joe, I'll email this to you. Sorry, I don't mean to take uh, <laughs> make you take hard notes on all this, but um, I think we should explicitly expand the authority of the Public Service Commission through legislation um, to directly address and enforce utility re reliability, grid planning, affordability, uh, decarbonization, and environmental justice. A lot of these things are kind of like peripherally in their purview, or they are afraid to kind of stick their necks out because statute maybe isn't strong enough in backing them, um, or there isn't legal precedent. So um, I think directly, explicitly expanding their authority over some of these things would go a long way. That's my five cents. Thank you. That was at least six. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Zittleman. Yeah, thank you. I have uh, three things I'd like to suggest. Um, I want to apologize to Erica because I popped out of the Zoom call for a second, so I'm not sure if you already talked about this at all. But um, the first thing is I personally would like to see the language about the um, DTE member coming to the Energy Commission meeting every month removed. I don't think they need that platform. They have more access to the city than most people. And I just think it's unnecessary. They do do a lot of greenwashing in our community. And I don't think we need to provide a greater platform for that. Um, secondly, um, on February 28th, Pontiac City Council unanimously passed a resolution calling on the state legislature to start a committee researching the feasibility of a democratically accountable state-run utility in Michigan. I think through this resolution, we should at least include a resolved clause of like support for that to investigate what all of our options are. And my last piece is just that I think Washtenaw County also passed a resolution to investigate the feasibility of establishing a countywide energy utility. And we should also state our support for that as well. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McKenna. Thank you. I just wanted to second um, Commissioner Zittleman's uh, request that that the um, the the clause about having to be at the Energy Commission meetings be removed um, strongly in favor of removal of that. I, I also oppose um, their involvement in this commission. Other comments. I'm going to rattle off a couple real quickly. Some of these are in writing already, so I won't go into detail. Um, first is um, eliminating or lifting the 1% cap on distributed renewable energy generation resources um, as a means of increasing reliability. Um, second, uh, utilities. Um, there is a comment about passing legislation broadly on regulating utilities. Um, utilities are unique in that they've been granted a monopoly by the state, yet they're still able to use what are ultimately, you know, what's ultimately revenue from us as ratepayers to to lobby on on their behalf and not necessarily in our interest, but in their interest. And so, um, 
I had indicated that um, there is an entity called the Energy Policy, the Energy and Policy Institute, and they have a, uh, a number of recommendations related to essentially better rules about uh, what utilities can and can't do, um, then better disclosure against those rules, and then finally better enforcement or put it this way, stronger deterrence when those rules are not adhered to. So a lot of the rules that we, as um, Commissioner Bergenowitz mentioned, there, there's, um, they're, they're, they're not very clear. And therefore the MPSC is, is not so clear on what they can and can't do. And so, and, and that applies also to the investor owned utilities. So doing something there to really better define those rules, um, which should be obviously in, um, in accordance with the values of the state. And then finally, then uh, obviously in, in enforcing that through, first of all, better requiring good disclosure. Um, and then, uh, like I said, um, better enforcement or, or deterrence. Um, then another thing that I think Michigan should consider, and you know, it depends on how, how wide of scope we want to have, but um, the state of California, I know, and maybe this is true in other states, um, they actually have legislation which funds something they call their public advocates office. And so when issues come before their public service commission, of course, the utilities are there and they are presenting information and evidence. Um, and by the way, that requires a lot of techno expertise in many cases. Um, and so um, what the state of California does is it provides funding for this other entity to go in and essentially lobby on behalf of ratepayers. Um, so it's um, there's a balance in 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 the equation. And then um, I know another commissioner here has, uh, and, and this is essentially what uh, Commissioner Berkowitz said, but uh, another commissioner has talked to me about um, essentially tying, um, and I don't know if this is possible, but bonuses and things like that, and essentially a compensation up and down the, the whole utility, um, the utility as a whole, but even um, something that would incentivize um, the right behavior on leadership. So that means bonuses, for example, would be tied to the right kinds of behaviors. I, I don't know if that's possible. That may be digging in too deep, but those are the kinds of things that I think that also should be considered. Um, uh, that Those are my main points. And um, Commissioner, or I mean, Council Member Briggs has those, um, but um, Joe, we probably want to put these all together in one document and share them with all the other council members. Um, does anybody else have any other ideas in the meantime? And if not, uh, then again, uh, please submit them to Joe by Thursday, um, as soon as possible, so that he can um, have something as a deliverable by the end of the day on Thursday. Um, Commissioner Smith. Thanks, Commissioner Mursky. Uh, yeah, I would just like to add in response, um, you know, also in agreement with uh, removing kind of DTE regular attendance in Energy Commission, but I would just like to kind of ask ourselves the question, happy to kind of share some thoughts on how do we garner the right insights um, to ensure that they are making meaningful progress without the greenwashing um, and to better hold them uh, accountable? You know, is that through legislation? Is that through some of these other resolutions? Um, but wanting to be sure that we too can hold them accountable um, and those insights likely being a, a, a helpful part of that. Uh, Council Member Briggs. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for providing this and um, hearing um, more in writing later. I'll, obviously, I'll pass this along and um, I know it'll be, not everything will get in, be incorporated. I know the, the resolution sponsor is trying to, you know, keep to the heart of what she was trying to create here, but I think this is really good insight. And um, I know that she'll be pulling pulling from this to, to strengthen the resolution. Um, also, if you're seeing anything in there, you just feel like is, um, could, you don't need to wordsmith, but if there's anything you really think, you know, would be stronger, um, if it was phrased a different way, I think she, uh, sponsors would probably welcome that as well. There may not be um, that many of, of these documents for our, especially for our local debt, uh, legislative delegation to draw from. And so we want it to be a strong guiding document for, especially for our, um, our legislators. So thank you so much.
Oh, and if there's, I'm not hearing support here for the resolve clause around DTE kind of coming regularly to, to hear for some reason, there's a silent majority here <laughs> that really does want to have that happen, you know, send a note on that, but thanks. Yeah, I think we, we broadly all agree that um, that if they if they appear would be at our request and with specific uh, uh, requested information that they report, but not something where they have a platform on a regular basis. Yep. And and I think um, you I, I can speak for the whole commission um, and thank um, all of the drafters of this that they acted on this um, and 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 did so with a great sense of urgency and that. Um, you didn't hear any any overall concerns with the the, the 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 spirit of the resolution at all. We re, I think we all really heartily endorse this. Um, like I said, we're not going to take a vote, but uh, it's uh, definitely you can say meets uh, our approval or gains our approval. Thank right. You. Okay. Uh, three topics down, two to go. So um, the next is uh, a second reading of the uh, performance transparency resolution. I thought I'd just give some background first rather than um, allowing that to come out sort of haphazard in the discussion. So just as a recap, um, there was a, a broader resolution that was passed by the Environmental Commission um, last year. Um, we looked at that and in our meeting, uh, last time we agreed that um, we would um, go ahead and um, proceed with that with uh, a second reading, um, but that there were a number of inputs that would be considered. And so um, let me just read off um, some comments. First of all, I think um, we all understand that city council in consultation with the administrator, um, should this resolution be taken up by council, will potentially change the language of this resolution. Um, it may be something closer to what we do. It may be something um, more broad, like what the energy, uh, or excuse me, the Environmental Commission did. But um, we, we, I think we should all recognize that uh, we don't have to perfect this because it's most likely going to be changed anyhow. And that includes some of the due dates or some of the dates that appear in there. Um, so since the last meeting, um, I shared a version of the resolution um, on uh, in a Google Doc. Um, with uh, our two liaisons, uh, council liaisons, and with Joe and Carlene. Um, um, Joe and Carlene provided input uh, via email, or excuse me, in the document, and the two uh, council liaisons provided uh, input um, via email. And um, first of all, um, council member Adina stated in his uh, communication that feels that this resolution should be just one element of creating a higher performing organization that delivers better outcomes to the city residents and I think we all agree on that and um, so you know we're, we're doing this in the spirit of that recognizing we're just looking at one one element of this um, uh, based on his input um, I modified one the first resolve clause as follows um, be it therefore resolved that the Energy Commission recommends that the City Council and the City Administration will review, and then this was the change, with input from City Boards and Commissions when appropriate, and that is leaving that to their judgment, the completeness, accuracy, and format of all um, above-mentioned KPIs. So that just um, makes it a little bit less prescriptive, um, and it um, I'll leave them discretion as to when they come to us for that input. Um, based on input from uh, Council Member Briggs, this was um, mentioned in the meeting, but also I think afterwards in our communication, we talked on the phone also a couple of times. Thank you, Council Member Briggs. Um, so I added a whereas clause, whereas in the November 2022 City of Ann Arbor, whereas in November 2022, City of Ann Arbor voters approved a 20 year one mill climate millage that will generate over $140 million in revenue for spending on climate and A20 carbon neutrality plan related projects and programs where their performance outcomes should be transparent and public facing. So it's just sort of a broad statement saying that uh, by having performance transparency, we'll have better insights into how that money is being spent and what kind of outcomes they are delivering. So just a couple of other points. Uh, I think everybody here knows that the A20 plan 
has um, what I would call leading indicators of success. Um, they're called indicators of success slash goals and timelines and initial actions, um, many with important intermediate targets that are key to achieving the overall um, target of net zero by 2030. And it's, I think it's also important for us to realize that the count, uh, the county has passed its resilient, uh, uh, resilient Washtenaw County Climate Action Plan, and they have for virtually every action goals and evaluation metrics for essentially all of their actions. And the county is only going to be able to to um, track those goals and, and progress against those metrics if it has performance input from the city of Ann Arbor. Um, so what else did I want to say here? I don't know if I have to go through all this. Um, so um, there is um, one other uh, comment from um, both Council Member Medina related to the resolution being um, overly prescriptive. Um, and first of all, um, Council Member uh, Briggs recommended um, the first resolve clause read. So um, maybe Joe, can you put that up so we can start to look at the resolve clauses because that's probably the most important thing. Yeah, I'll do that here. Yeah. In theory, once I find the right thing. That's the second on yep. the, the first one. Oh, I meant on Zoom trying to find where the shares uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Always okay. hiding. All right. Okay, if you can go down to the resolve clauses. Um, so the first one um, is um, that um, it simply read um, that uh, the Energy Commission recommends that City Council engage the city administrator to ensure that key energy, climate, and A20 related policy objectives. So this um, uh, I'll mention about all of the above KPIs that, uh, that, that basically is just distilled down to key. Um, city policy objectives and strategic goals and KPIs be published and updated regularly on the city's website. Um, so, um, just, um, speaking for myself, um, that kind of language I think is fine, whether it's called the city's performance measures webpage or some other webpage in the future is really sort of irrelevant. I think, uh, what's important maybe in the language or that as a key takeaway that there be a central repository, that they're not scattered all over the place on the city's website. That doesn't mean that they can't appear in two places, but that there's a place where people know that they can go to to get um, information. So it, it's uh, not on distributed um, on just you know hundreds of different web pages that people have to search through, but that it be somewhere um, on the city's website and that'd be a central repository. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that and open things up for discussion. Commissioner Harp and then Commissioner Smith. Thank you. Um, I had two two questions. Um, one was sort of the a, a question about KPIs in general um, and the extent to which they're outcomes based and holistic in what they're measuring and indicating. Um, and so maybe that's just a, a question about a clarification of of what might be implicit in, in how KPRs are described here. And then the second question, you know, based quite a bit on some of the previous presentations and, and discussions earlier in this meeting is um, where equity and engagement might exist in among these KPIs um, as they as they relate directly to the climate energy and ATR U0 related policy goals. Um, and whether that needs to be made more explicit in this resolution or or whether that um, is is already assumed um, primarily through the A20 plan. Um, taking the second first, I 
from, as far as I'm concerned, that's sort of assumed in the 820 plan based on these indicators of success um, and, and uh, the timelines that are um, in the plan. And by the way, it's a living plan. So the plan is uh, likely to be updated um, with what frequency I don't think uh, is, is all that important at this point. Um, did that, did that address, address at least your second point? I think so, yes. Yeah, and your first point again, can you clarify that again for me? Sorry. It, I'm curious about what's assumed about KPIs and, and what they are, what they encompass. Um, what is it that you are looking for? What is it that, that are they outcomes-based at one, both in, to some extent, that's, um, I think, clarified in both specifying leading and li lagging indicators. Right. Um, and so I was just trying to get a sense of um, how holistic the, the KPRs are that we're aiming for and what they're measuring. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if that needs to be fully explicit in this or not. Um, and it was just sort of a question for clarification, I think. Well, I may I'll speak for myself. Um, I think that's, um, in a sense, um, for... Um, Council and the administrator to decide, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, so the the plan calls for a fifty percent reduction in vehicle miles traveled. So you know that that's that's really an important indicator. Um, there's um, also specifics about um, the number of um, uh, whether I think it's a percentage of weatherization. There's a uh, um, number of housing units to be created. Um, it's a relatively modest goal, but there are there are specific figures in in the in the plan. And the question is, uh, how are we performing against the targets that are that are in the plan? Um, and part of this is so that we're not just looking in the rearview mirror where we get the 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 um, the index, the, the that's not the index, the, but the inventory um, for the last year, but that we're actually monitoring some of these main contributing factors um, along the way. And by the way, again, remember, this was not written with a specific focus on the A20 plan because we are an energy commission and we're focused on climate and energy. This was sort of adapted. There's there's other, other areas um, where the city is performing, where those that level of transparency that we're getting from OSI, um, which frankly is is exemplary in many regards compared to other parts of the city, but there's still room for improvement. I think even um, as related to energy, climate, and A two zero related goals. Uh, Commissioner Smith. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, as a follow on to our conversation around equity earlier, um, I guess I don't know if it necessitates an update to the language directly, but just ask that we kind of think about, um, is it within the context of the work plan um, that we think about non-digital forms of sharing this information to be transparent, um, recognizing the language kind of uh, focuses in on web page, um, you know, being that uh, uh, opportunity for transparency, but can we leverage, you know, community engagement sessions to also share some of this information as well? Right. Um, there, the last, can you scroll down to the last resolve clause? Um, I think it's um, that there's a statement here about um, that there is some kind of um, annual review and that would uh, likely happen in the public domain could be attended um, in, in person. So that somewhat addresses that, but I don't think probably to the degree it deserves to be. I, I like the general thrust of your of your your point. Um, can I go back to the first um, statement where we crossed out current and replaced it with key? So now I just remember what my thought was here. So my thought was that anything that is currently tracked, in this case now, A20 climate energy related, but thinking more broadly, anything that is tracked be linked to the city's performance webpage by June 30th. That's why the date is so soon. It's just simply taking information that is on individual sites, for example, in this case, OSI webpage. And if someone goes to the city's 
performance web measures web page, there's no mention of the greenhouse gas inventory there. So it's just simply creating a link to information that is somewhere else already on the city's web page. So that would be applied to solid waste, because I know the solid waste or the, the solid waste uh, team um, tracks diversion rate and other kinds of things, but that's not on this web page. There's other kinds of things. So it's just simply asking that current object, uh, objectives be linked to this web page. Um, so this is not talking about the long-term uh, ideas of, of what might go there. This is just looking at the short term. So my recommendation, if it's okay with council member Briggs, um, that we leave it as current, that, re that actually, um, limits the scope of that resolve class to just what is currently being done by by OSI. OSI that wouldn't have to do anything except put a link on the performance web page so that if someone goes there, they can get information directly without having to search for it on the OSI's web page. Council Member Briggs. Yeah, thank you. And um, I want to thank you for continuing to be an advocate for this sort of work in the city. We've had a number of conversations over the years about how important it is. Um, you know, I think from, I find myself on a tricky position in a tricky place on this commission. I honestly don't think that council members should be voting members of any commissions. We're user advisory board to council. And so I feel yeah, it's my, my job here to be sort of the liaison to the commissions, so you know, what's going on at council and then taking it, having a better understanding of what's going on in the commissions and bringing that forward to council. Um, but um, that is not the case <laughs> uh, in many of my commissions. I'm also a voting member, as is the case here. So um, I view this commission differently, I think, than is necessary for a number of commission for commissioners to view it. But I will let you know how I'm looking at this. So, um, you know, when I look at this resolution, the last I can't find my phone now. There we go. Sorry. Um, so the last three whereas clauses, um, I think, are what's the heart of really what's critically important about this in terms of, you know, the that we should have complete, transparent, easily accessible information about government operations and performance that we passed it, um, you know, the voters approved a millage and um, need to understand, you know, how, the performance outcome, um, that there are other municipalities out there across the country that are have these really outstanding public, these dashboards that are providing um, stronger information about their progress towards their, their community goals. And so there's a lot for us to be learning. However, for me, when I look at the resolved clauses, um, as I've talked to um, Chair Mursky about, these are very prescribed exactly how the city administrator should should reach those whereas clauses. And so, you know, I know from my perspective that the city um, is working on redoing a website. Um, and I don't know to the degree that we can get this, these, you know, things up on the information up on our website, or we'd even actually want to take the time right now in the midst of everything to spend the staff time to do that <laughs> as we're transitioning over. Um, you know, the, sort of the, the work plan with the um, with the timeline and due dates, you know, however the city administrator um, chooses to, to manage this work is, is fine by me as long as we have this outward facing information we're reporting back um, in a way that's clear and transparent to the public. So for myself this evening, I'm gonna be voting against this, not because I don't um, support the general purpose of it, but because the prescript, for me, as a council member, this is a bit overly prescriptive. However, <laughs> as a commission, I don't think that commissioners need to be as concerned about this um, unless you are sort of a, you know, you know, there's more that you want in here. Um, council member Rodina and I will be taking this. Um, I know the Energy Environmental Commission has passed something similar um, and trying to work to implement this in some way um, if this moves, you know, in our in our city. So I just want to explain myself a little bit and uh, explain my thinking and on it and happy to answer any questions too. Uh, other commissioners, what is your perspective on this? What's your recommendations? Um, we've
Commissioner Calvin Garcia. As you mentioned, uh, John, I did have some input into this already. And so my question now is, I'm really, really um, grateful that you shared uh, with us, Councilman Briggs, what your perspective is on this. And if you wouldn't mind um, elaborating a little bit on how, in, even though you will be voting against this tonight, like, like what aspect of it would you be bringing forward um, with uh, Council Member Ravina? Thank you. Yeah, and so for me, I mean, I have to look at resolved clauses. That's how I read a resolution. I look at what's in the resolved clause, and this is what I mean. And I, if I'm voting for the, if I'm as a council member, I want to be able to take something that is in a resolved clause and feel like I'm going to move for really wholeheartedly move forward each element in a resolved clause. Um, and I, I can't commit to doing that um, this evening. However, I think the spirit of this resolution is great. I think the general substance of it is, is, is spot on. Um, the details of how we work it out um, is, is, is what we need to work with um, our IT department on, our city administrator. Um, I think there's a role for um, you know, working with other council members to hear what they're hearing in other commissions as well. But I think the the piece around, you know, for what I'm looking at is in many ways, you know, this this public services dashboard piece around how we're improving transparency on our um, in progress towards our stated community goals. Um, that's that's the piece that I'm committed to to moving forward. Thank you very much for explaining that, elaborating. Any other comments? So I think from a Robert's Rules of Orders perspective, we had a motion to consider this. We had a second. We had discussion about it. It was then reviewed and updated. It was uh, changed and is um, in front of us. Uh, again, my my personal uh, hope is even actually that this resolution does not go to council as is for approval, that this be recrafted, um, reviewed uh, in terms of um, overall priorities of the city, um, best practices, um, not only within the city, but outside the city, and that something in this spirit, as well as in the spirit of the other uh, resolution passed by the Environmental Commission moves forward. Um, I'm hoping, uh, again, speaking for myself, and I won't take it personally if people vote otherwise, but I'm hoping that the Energy Commission um, approves this um, simply to say, we, we believe that this is necessary and appropriate, um, not only for A20 and climate and energy, but more generally across the city. So I'm going to let others speak again, and then I'm going to ask for a vote. Does anybody else have any other comments? OK, so um, all those in favor of passing the resolution, um, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, so the motion passes, the resolution passes. Um, I didn't count the number, but it's uh, one, uh, all votes for, except uh, Council Member Briggs voted against as she indicated that she would, and I think we all understand why. So thanks very much. Great. So it is 826. And I know it's getting late, but I would like to at least introduce the last resolution simply um, as something for our consideration. Um, so hopefully people have had a chance to at least skim it. Um, obviously, we had public comment about it. I'm wondering if we can get a motion to consider it and a second. And if so, then we can take brief comments. 
and then based on some of those brief comments, uh, get an indication of um, are there key elements that need to be reworked and to provide uh, maybe a subgroup of this group to look at reworking um, the resolution as appropriate um, between now and a second reading. Uh, is there interest in this? And can I get a motion to consider the resolution? Moved by Commissioner Peck and seconded by Commissioner McKenna. So I'll open it up for discussion. Commissioner Harper. I just had one one um, clarification about the whereas statement with the State Bureau of Construction Codes not adopting the zero code appendix. Um, my understanding, my current understanding was that it hadn't, it had neither been explicitly adopted nor drafted. So it's just, um, or left out. So it was, that was just a clarification. Yeah, that my understanding, maybe that we need to look at that language. My understanding is it's not any of the drafts that are currently being considered for approval. So the like the the assumption is, is that it will not be approved. But maybe we need to retweak that language to reflect the less certainty there. But okay, great, good point. Other thoughts. Councilmember Briggs. Um, and we talked about this earlier today. Um, it, this is we're going to revisit the resolution um, again at a future meeting. I think it would be helpful to change um, the last couple of resolve clauses so it's focused very much on directing um, city council um, just specifically to do certain do work in this area um, and to leave out references um, necessarily even to the city administrator or city planning commission, um, just being cognizant that maybe it's not appropriate for, we generally try to stay away from other commissions, directing other commissions to do work. Um, but I think, you know, urging city council to, to be focused in on, on, um, on specific issues is, is helpful. Um, I also think it's um, important to know that we are evaluating our options um, and reviewing them very carefully. And so um, Sorry, sometimes we <laughs> I have to speak very carefully when it comes to sort of legally related issues. And so um, I guess I'll just leave it at that. I, I sometimes am careful. Uh, I just don't, I wanna be very careful in my wording here. Um, this is something that I find to be very important as well. Um, so council's action on this doesn't have um, anything to do necessarily with um, lack of um, desire on the part of council to do things. Other thoughts or questions? So I'll leave you with two thoughts. Um, there's really, I think, two points that are being made by this resolution. And the first is that um, we're just simply encouraging with the first resolve clause that the city move as quickly as possible, recognizing that it is doing so um, in many different ways, as uh, in some ways uh, that are not so visible even to us as commissioners and certainly um, to lay people. And the second, I think, is the second resolve clause simply saying um, that whatever approach we take, um, and there has been a number of different approaches that have been looked at, the possibility exists that the preferred routes may not um, be uh, something that can go into effect immediately. Um, and therefore, it's just simply asking um, that the city look at other levers it may have. And there's just a few examples that are given here. And it's not meant to be prescriptive. It's just to be to give some examples that there may be things that the city can do um, in the interim to really drive the type of development and construction that we would like to see here. I think that's really the message that 
uh, we're trying to to deliver if indeed we agree to pass this. So I, I, I prefer not to take a vote. I don't see that it's necessary to take a vote. We've already discussed this. Um, we have uh, one council member that's participated tonight. I know that council member Adina has also looked at this. Um, so um, it's there's no real urgency to do this. There are some things that I think we can do in terms of tweaking with the language. And um, then we can vote on this uh, a month from now and uh, maybe craft this a little bit more precisely. Um, but I think um, we heard the messages from the public. And I think if we speak with one voice, that provides another um, push to look for action at these two levels. Uh, Commissioner McKenna. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I agree with you. Thank you for your comments there. And just offering uh, help to revise this if, if anyone's interested. Um, I know I'm seeing something right now that I think is technically inaccurate. Um, just from a technical engineering standpoint. So um, I'd be happy to read it over and provide comments if, if anyone wants to read them <laughs> or do that with me. <clears throat> you have another volunteer right here. Um, any other volunteers? Which doesn't mean that someone can't uh, propose language changes uh, when we take this up again. But if anybody else is has interest, um, either let me know now or let me know later. Otherwise I will work with Commissioner McKenna and probably in consultation also with staff and with the two council members. And then we'll bring this back um, in, in uh, our April meeting unless something dramatic happens in the meantime, which would be wonderful. Okay, good. So uh, we may actually get out of here in a few more minutes. The last couple of things on the agenda is a uh, report from the energy office and then we'll open things up to reports from commissioners sure um yeah first thing i'll say you, you all should be subscribed at this point to the uh osi newsletter um if you're not feel free to either let me know or go ahead and get yourself subscribed on there um but that there's lots of great news that'll come out of there um but there's a couple couple of things that have come up just recently and by recently for this one is just today um We've just been awarded two different grants um, from SEMCOG for a couple of different, uh, couple of different things. Um, the first is for uh, fiscal year 2024. Um, it'll be the, for the conversion of some streetlights to LEDs. Uh, the award is $980,000 plus a local match of $245,000. Um, we'll, we'll be replacing over 4,000 low efficiency uh, bulbs into high efficiency LED fixtures. Um, the new ones will be one to 1.2 to three times more efficient, um, meaning we'll be saving money. And um, this is an action A20 and should save us around uh, what 3,417 kilograms per day of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. Um, the second project is, will be for fiscal year 2026 and is a build out of the Washington Bike Boulevard. Uh, for this project, we won $200,000 with a $50,000 local match. Uh, to build out a 0 0.8 mile long all ages and abilities bike priority corridor as a low stress alternative to biking on Huron Avenue. Uh, this will reduce daily carbon dioxide equivalent emissions by 476.75 kilograms. Missy, anything else to mention on that one in particular? This was the first match of the village. And so that's how we were able to get these dollars by putting the match already in play. So uh, pretty exciting. Um, yeah, several other things that are kind of happening all over. Um, I can't remember if we've talked about this previously, but we had the launch of our commercial Solarize uh, program. Um, they are starting to recruit, recruit folks um, and kind of get them in for the um, for the pilot phase of that. It's in collaboration with the 2030 district. Um, concept is very similar to the existing Solarize program. Um, this one is just working more, um, you know, with, with with commercial entities as opposed to single family homeowners. Um, couple other things that have come up. Um, I saw city council released funds for um, administering some of the, the, the low income sustainability program. Um, we are currently working with a couple of our partners. Um, just given the timeline, it's going to be working with a couple of our local partners in the housing commission in Avalon to be um, getting, getting some good work on some of their different facilities um, to make sure they are able to access a couple of different sustainability features that their, um, their funding did not previously allow for. Um, 
as I said, there's a few more things kind of in the newsletters here or there. So make sure you're checking those out. Um, that is what we have right now. Great. I'd like to open things up uh, to updates from commissioners. Commissioner McKenna, did you have your hand up still or not? Nope. Okay. Um, other reports from any of us of general interest or maybe even to the public that's listening in? Commissioner Peck, great uh, evening last night. Thanks uh, for C's continuing to hold those uh, lectures with great speakers. Councilmember Briggs. Yeah, um, a few things from updates from council. Um, as one of the public commenters noted, there was um, an exciting uh, PUD um, plan unit development project um, on the Anniversary fifth ward that um, was approved by council that's um, all electric um, and has a lot of sustainability um, components to it. So that was a nice new development that was approved um, at last council meeting. Also, the villages of Ann Arbor moved forward. That's something that I know this commission um, took some time to, to provide some input on as well. Um, that was sort of a, a mixed. Uh, it, it has more in it than we would see by by right at what was required out of our zoning code. Um, it's all electric for the um, the single family homes. It is not all electric for the um, many um, sort of um, multifamily uh, units that are on the um, on on the site. So uh, I know there was some community concern around that. Um, but just did want to let folks know that that had moved through council. Um, and um, brownfield um, dollars were also approved. Uh, something that may be of interest to you that's on the next um, the council agenda. Um, hold it up because I wanted to give you the number for it. It's CA 20 um, on the next council agenda resolution directing the city administrator to begin negotiating a new natural gas franchise. I suspect you have seen uh, information in the news about this. Um, Obviously, this is um, something that uh, this council still needs to approve. Um, it is um, an exciting step that the city is taking um, in terms of um, negotiating um, what we want our new franchise agreement to look like and the benefits that we want to have for our community. So um, I know that uh, the if this uh, moves forward, um, there will be some listening sessions out in the community and also um, staff will be making presentations here more on that as well um, and getting more uh, commission input on it. Um, I don't think there's anything else pressing. Um, I guess just from a staff, um, feedback to staff, certainly the power outages that we saw, um, I have heard a lot of feedback from community members around interest and in wanting to know more about solar. Um, I have seen that, I saw that in the last newsletter, but I think there's there's a lot of appetite right now to understand how people, how homes actually, for those that have, for folks that have done those investments, um, what what those storms look like for them. And so I think there's an opportunity to, to, um, to be doing some more presentations on that and, and talking to, to residents about what the experiences look like, depending on um, sort of different improvements that they made in their home. Any other updates? Okay, next agenda item is committee updates. Um, I'm actually not aware of any active committees or, or working groups right now. Carlene, I think the last one was transportation electrification, but it's really not active. So if that can, is indeed the case, then I would say we strike that from the standard agenda. And until such time, we have either a, an ongoing or an ad hoc uh, committee or working group, then we could add that back in. Is that correct, that Carlene? Okay, good. Um, next is report from the Environmental Commission. As you guys know, I'm the liaison. Um, so real briefly, we had uh, presented um, the same equitable engagement presentation that Michelle gave us tonight. 
Um, there was a discussion about the city's handling of biosolids and concern with PFAS levels in biosolids and whether those should uh, continue to be uh, essentially uh, dispersed as uh, an, a form of fertilizer on agricultural fields or whether biosolids given PFAS uh, contamination should be going to landfill. And so that's a, an ongoing discussion. It's being reviewed by staff. It was presented by staff. Um, there's no final decision. Um, but there's likely to be action on that. I'm, obviously, um, we're conflicted um, with that. I think everybody is, um, but we have a, a, a new significant and emerging problem with bioaccumulative um, persistent toxins, and we don't want to just be spreading those around the environment. Um, on the other hand, we don't necessarily want them to go to, to landfill where they then... Uh, turn into methane and potentially cause, uh, contribute to greenhouse uh, gas and global and, and, and climate uh, warming or uh, climate change. Um, so, and the last thing we did is we had a brief discussion on um, the solid waste budget. There's gonna be a, another discussion in the April meeting, but at least I can report to all of you that um, the solid waste budget is in good shape. The, um, revenue and expenses were basically balanced the last two fiscal years, and the solid waste fund uh, uh, reserve fund has about $15 million in it. Uh, several years ago, it was projected to actually go below zero. The target is for it to have 25% of the annual um, uh, estimated expenses, um, and that would amount to roughly, or just a little bit less than 5 million, and we have roughly 15 million in there. So the reserve fund's in good shape and that will enable us potentially to do some good things um, with the buildup of funds in that in that reserve. So those are the th key report outs from the Environmental Commission. Um, we are now winding down and somewhere here, I have my little script for public input. Here we go. So this is the second opportunity for public input uh, with the ability for persons to speak up to three minutes. If you're watching on CTN uh, or uh, calling in, call 888-788-0099 or 877-853-5247. And enter the meeting ID 9568718 This information is also displayed on the meeting agenda and the video feed. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. Two, raise your hand electronically to indicate your desire to speak. Please press star nine on your phone. You will hear an automated message that the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet space and uh, state your name and address so that um, we know where you're calling from and who you are at the beginning of your comments. Don't currently have any hand raised, but give it a few just okay. in case. Yep. We must have made everybody happy tonight. Must have, yeah. Don't have don't have any other hands raised, so I think we're good okay. to move on. Very good. So um, I want to thank all of you for your service. I also want to especially thank um, Missy for staying on for the duration of the call and, and appearing to us and to staff and to our council liaisons. Um, thanks to all of you. Have a nice rest of your evening. Um, as chair, I'm calling this meeting to a close at 8.46 p.m. Thanks and have a rest, like I said, a, a nice rest of your evening. Hopefully do something more fun than, than, a, than a, uh, an energy commission meeting. <laughs> well, it could be more fun than that, John. That could be more fun than that. <laughs>
<laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good night.